Okay, well, it is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Venket Holly. Here. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Good to have you all with us. Uh, here on behalf of the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. And we also have Michael Cunningham, who's the acting town council. Here. Good to have you with us as well. Um, and then going, looking at the three hearings we have scheduled for this evening. Um, Appearing for docket 3764, 212 Pleasant Street uh, would be Nellie Aikenhead. Here. Good to have you with us. Uh, docket 3770, 4042 Dorothy Road, um, which is a housing corporation of Arlington. Uh, so Erica Schwartz, are you with us? Here, yes. Wonderful. And uh, docket 3771, 28 Buena Vista Road, uh, Valerie, Valerie Bruno and Matthew Stone. We are here. Wonderful. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the executive remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the, <clears throat> excuse me, as the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals of the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So this evening, we will start with our administrative items. Um, so item two on our agenda is the approval of the decision for five Mystic Lake Drive, which was docket 3761. Uh, this was a decision that was written by Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments, and a final version posted back to the board this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for five Mystic Lake Drive? Hearing none, the board, the chair will accept a motion to approve the written decision for five Mystic Lake Drive. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. This is a vote of the members present at that hearing um, to approve the written decision for five Mystic Lake Drive. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That takes us to item three in our agenda, approval of the decision for 15 Moccasin Path. This is 
a decision, <clears throat> excuse me, that was, I believe, written by Mr. Holly um, and distributed to the board for questions and comments and a final version released later this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 15 Moccasin Path? Hearing none, the chair will accept a motion to approve the written decision for 15 Moccasin Path. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you, sir. Second. 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 Uh, roll call vote of the members who voted on that decision. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. The chair votes aye. That decision is approved. Brings us to item four on our agenda. Approval of the decision for 32 Appleton Street. This is a decision that I wrote, uh, distributed to the board for questions and comments. Final version posted this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 32 Appleton Street? Seeing none, the chair will accept a motion to approve the written decision for 32 Appleton Street. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Roll call vote of those voting members on this hearing. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That brings us to item five on our agenda, the uh, approval of the decision for 106 Mount Vernon Street. This is a case that was heard at our last hearing. Um, I wrote the decision. Um, I had passed it past town council for uh, review as well. Um, there was one late comment from Mr. DuPont, which I have uh, corrected and asked um, Ms. Ralston to include in the final version, uh, which I forwarded to her later this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 106 Mount Vernon? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I was not present at the time that the uh, hearing was uh, took place and uh, have avoided uh, taking any part in the consideration or decision of this. So I wanted the record to indicate that I will abstain on this vote. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. Okay, then with that... Um... You no know, other comment on the decision. I will accept a motion to approve the written decision for 106 Mount Vernon Street. Mr. Chairman, so Mr. moved. Chairman. Thank you. And Second. Is that Mr. Riccadelli? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so a vote of the members present um, at that hearing. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That decision is approved. That brings us to the written decision for 77 Tanager Street. Uh, this was a <clears throat> hearing heard at our last meeting. Decision was written by Mr. Riccadelli, distributed to the board for questions and comments. Final version posted to the board this afternoon. Are there any further written um, any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 77 Tanager Street? Seeing none, the chair will accept a motion to approve the written decision for 77 Tanager Street. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Roll call vote of those voting on the decision. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. Okay. That brings <laughs> us to the end of the administrative items section of our hearing. This brings us up to the start of the public hearings. Uh, before opening tonight's public hearings, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. Any vote taken at this hearing will be preliminary until the written decision is approved by the board as a subsequent meeting. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. 
So with that, the next item on our agenda is docket number 3764, 212 Pleasant Street. It's a continuance of a prior hearing. And I would ask the applicant, Ms. Aikenhead, to um, introduce herself and bring us up to speed on where we are. Okay. Hi, I'm Nellie Aikenhead. I'm one of the applicants. Mark Halliday is also here. He's the other applicant. Uh, there's a few things that have been going on. One is to establish the average finished grade, and another is to answer some of the abutters re requests for information. I can also restate our request, but maybe you already know that we should maybe do the finished grade first, I was thinking. Sure, let's go ahead and address that. Um, I can bring up the plan. Oh yeah, I can also share my screen if you want. Uh, that would be great. Um, Colleen, do you mind giving Ms. Aiken had that permission? Yep, you should be all set now. I should be? Okay. Yep. Should be able to share screen. Can you see it or no? Not yet. Yep. Let me see. Now? There we go. Yes. Okay, good. So basically, I thought that I, I know the most probably important and critical question is the question about the average grade. I thought I could address that first. And then as the board sees fit, I can reply to the questions and accusations from the abutters and their attorneys. They have implied that we haven't been transparent or provided any details, but in fact, about 90% of their concerns have already been publicly vetted and approved by town boards, including the CONSCOM, the Historic District Commission, and as part of those processes, the engineering department and the tree warden. But starting with the average finished grade, uh, on August 28th, as I'm sure you all know, the ISD issued a memo stating that our average finished grade was 12.71 feet, and therefore, with the basement ceiling height of 19 feet, our basement met the definition of a story. We have since then had several conversations with ISD and subsequently had our surveyor uh, correct and add information to our survey, including the following. One. The elevation measurements now reflect the town's standard methodology for a sloped lot, which means that the measurements are taken at a point six feet away from the dwelling rather than on the corner of the buildings. Two, the rear elevations, which are shown here, are now based on the height of a future retaining wall at the back of the house. The location, type, and size of the wall was included in our Notice of Intent application to the Conservation Commission, which was approved in June 2022, we, um, the formal order of conditions were recorded with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on July 21st. We proposed a wall on the eight foot contour line, two to three feet, approximately two to three feet high, which brings the elevation up to about 11.2, I think. Three, we clarified that the bump out at the back of the house let's see this, was a deck, not finished space. So the six foot six foot off the house measurement is around here rather than six foot off a deck, which is 14 feet off the house. When the ISD calculated the 12.71 foot average finished grade, they were measuring six feet off the deck or 14 feet off the house. Because this is a really steep area, it had a big impact on the calculation. And finally, we have all measurements are now based on proposed rather than existing elevations. Uh, the average grade is calculated at 14.64 feet with a basement ceiling height of 19 feet. The differential is 4.34 feet, which is less than four and a half feet. So therefore, it's not a story. The butters have the abutters have implied that these are my numbers, but they are not. These calculations were made by a licensed surveyor based on in the field instrument data collection, which was used to create 
a signed, certified, recordable survey. We have nothing to do with the numbers other than the, other than fine-tuning the methodology that the building department preferred to use. I can go on to other things that they've questioned, or maybe we want to have a discussion about this first. Why don't you go ahead and, and continue? Okay. So they've, they've questioned a bunch of stuff, including parking, drainage, GFA, steps to the pond, scale and massing, et cetera. Uh, the, park, the abutters have stated that the existing parking is, parking is unsafe and insufficient. And at the same time, they are objecting to our proposed improvements. We can and have parked two cars in the existing paved area, and we can and have been able to turn around at the end of our driveway and drive out facing forward. It does take a bit of maneuvering, which is why we are proposing and have had approved an increase in the existing 20 by 24 impervious parking area to a slightly larger 22 by 29 foot parking area. This um, proposal is part of the notice of intent, which was submitted to the Conservation Commission in May 2022. And we had two public meetings, many of others were there, and it was approved by the Conservation Commission in June 2022. The abutters have also claimed that we um, haven't provided any details on water flow and drainage. The opposite of true, is true. Here are the details on our proposed parking area. We're proposing gravel with a 40% void that will be able to collect water. We have a true grid permeable paver system at the top with smaller stone. This is a profile of what the system will look like. And the water capture of the area, 22 by 29 by 6 inches deep, is which is 319 cubic feet, will be approximately 958 gallons of water. Not only do we propose this to the Conservation Commission and get their approval, they ran it by the town engineer, Wayne Chouinard, who added a few more stipulations that had to do with soil types and depth of the stone base, and he also signed off on this proposal. It's very detailed, it's not no information. Furthermore, the neighbors have questioned our calculations of the changes from pervious to impervious surfaces. Those calculations were reviewed and approved by the assistant town engineer, Bill Copperthorne, as part of our stormwater management application that was filed with, the, with our special permit application in January 2023. So those have been addressed. Another question that the abutters have raised is the so-called lack of details for the replacement of these cinder block steps going down to the pond. Again, this is part, this is taken from our notice of intent that was submitted to the Conservation Commission in May 2022 and approved in June 2022. We provided many details. These steps do not meet code, they're unstable, and they're diverting the water to the left side where it's eroding the soil and undermining our retaining wall. We have proposed to create 12 new steps with a seven inch risers located over 20 inch, 20 foot distance with a seven foot drop from the parking area to the mostly flat lower level of the path. Where the spacing will allow for equidistant one foot, eight inch long treads to the back portion that's filled in with permeable bedding and gravel, slightly compacted to form a foundation for the left cut granite. This is not no details. It's particularly disingenuous of the abutters to object to this because the owners of 216 Pleasant Street installed these concrete steps on our property and the abutters at 218 Pleasant Street subsequently clear cut this land, which is our property. They didn't have our permission, they didn't inform us, and they didn't tell the Conservation Commission that they were doing this work in a 100 foot setback. And now when we want to fix it by creating this, we're getting a lot of grief. I think the last big question that the abutters raised in their last letter was the gross floor area. The neighbors are questioning our figures in the application because they include the basement. They referred to this um, uh, definition in section two of the zoning bylaw, which is a very short definition of what GFA means. They neglected to consider the larger definition in section 5.3.22 which specifically states that the basement areas, except as excluded to below, which is uh, the systems area, are included in GFA. So we included it in our figures as is required by this 
definition. I guess one last thing is that they, the abutters, this is specifically the Barbara House chart of lot coverage, saying that our lot coverage is higher by twice as much as the other three lots around us. They cherry pick the data showing only three supersized over lots, oversized lots with 21,000 square feet, 16,700 square feet, and 19,000 square feet of land compared to ours at 6,800 square feet of land. So of course we have the most lot coverage. The Barber House, who are closest abutters, do not include their own property. We more fairly, when looking at this data for the Historic District Commission, looked at every single property from Route 2 to uh, the to 206 Pleasant, which is the last house on Spy Pond, and the results were very different. I don't have, I thought that professional services might write a memo. They said they would on the average finished grade. I don't have that, but I have this little sticky note from Dave saying, okay, as long as conservation said okay to the routine wall. Yep. Great, thank you for that. Um, so the board did receive, um, after the end of closing today, a memo from inspectional services. Okay. So if I can go ahead, um, I'm going to grab the sharing here. Oh. Um, and where's <laughs> the memo? Um, so hopefully you, you see the memo docket 3764212 Pleasant Street. Uh, that's a single family dwelling on Spy Pond, R1. Applicant seeking special permit for two-story addition, 942 square feet. The applicant applied to the Conservation Commission due to the proximity based on the application to the conservation approval minutes from 6-16-22. The current renderings of the property by the architect, which include a retaining wall, the basement will no longer be considered a story once the application conditions are met. Um, Inspector Geldart reviewed the site plan with the proposed retaining wall, and if the wall is built according to the plan approved by conservation, the basement will not qualify as a story. And the Historic District Commission has also extended the approval for the project, excuse me, until January 27th, 2024. Um, so that's the information that was provided by Inspectional Services. Okay. So, okay. The, so the application that was before the board, um, and if the initial application, it is uh, a special permit for a large addition um, because the uh, the it, the addition that is and a large addition only includes area gross floor area that is outside of the uh, existing foundation for the structure. So in this case, it is that front uh, or we'll referred to as the front right corner, um, which is approximately nine hundred and forty two square feet. Um, and there was uh, some question about whether or not uh, the basement would be included in that calculation. Um, so I did want to go back to um, that section of the bylaw, which I'll pull up here in a second. 22, there we are. Uh, it says, <clears throat> for first the bylaw, the following areas of buildings are to be included in the calculation of gross floor area. Um, obviously, we have no elevator shafts. Uh, there's no stairwell in this part of the building, the attic area. Um, this is a, This does not have an attic in this area. Interior mezzanines, there are no interior mezzanines. There's no penthouses. So basement areas are included, except as ex excluded if they are exclusively for mechanical uses accessory to the option of the operation of the building. Cellars are included. And the, the difference is a basement is just that more than 50% of it is exposed. Uh, and then a cellar is less than 50% is exposed above grade. Um, porches are included and garages except as included in the one below. So for this application, um, 
although the the so the lower the lowest floor is not considered a story so it, the building does does not rise above two and a half floors um but according to the plans that portion of the the building on the lowest level is identified uh, let me go ahead and just change the sharing on this So this is that lowest floor. It's identified as indoor and indoor outdoor room on a new concrete slab. Um, so obviously it is not a utility room. Um, and then above it is a living room, entry, mudroom space, and on top would be a bedroom. So the full portion of that would be included uh, in the gross floor area. So the the intended addition and gross floor area still exceeds 750 square feet. Uh, so the 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 need for a um, a special permit for a large addition remains. Um, and so because of that, the board, in addition to the regular findings that the board would be required to make for a special permit, the board would also need to find that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. We would need to consider, the dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. And we would need to consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. Um, those are the, the additional findings that are required under the zoning bylaw for a large addition. Um, <clears throat> so with that, are there any additional questions uh, from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. Uh, can I just ask one question in relation to the square footage? So I, I think um, the applicant mentioned uh, 936 square feet was added to the building, but the addition uh, on, the, on the data spreadsheet is 1,600 square feet. So if, if the applicant could just clarify um, what the difference is between those numbers. Okay, so I don't I don't have the spreadsheet right with me, but there's a second story and then there's an addition and they're two separate things. So maybe the total is 1600. I'm not exactly sure. I, I'm not looking at my papers. One thing I didn't did want to mention was that I did ask for 936 square feet addition. But in fact, I realized uh, that the floor one and floor two have a cantilever that are about 40 feet bigger than the footprint. So in fact, the if you count the, the 312 plus 352 and 352, it's about it's just over a thousand square feet. Okay, understood. So so there's a, about a thousand square feet of addition and then the rest is a uh, new second floor that's on the existing footprint of the house. Correct. And because some of it has a slanted ceiling, it's not a full square second floor, it's not the exact same size as the first floor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Other members of the board with questions? Seeing none, hearing none. Um, we'll move on to public comment. Um, <clears throat> so I will, in a moment, I'll open the meeting for public comment. Remind the public that public questions and comments are taken only as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom oh. application. Those calling it by phone can dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by myself. You'll be asked to give your name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to speak first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, then the public comment period will be closed. And we will do our best to show documents 
um, as they are requested. Grab my notebook. So with that, uh, I will open the public comment period. So if there are members of the public who wish to address the board, please go ahead and use the raise hand feature. Um, the first hand I see raised is John Garber. If you could give your name and address for the record and uh, provide us with your comment. Yes, of course. Thank, thanks so much uh, to the to the chair and the ZBA. So I, I'm John Garber. Um, I'm here with my wife, Sabrina. We live at 214 Pleasant Street, um, and we have our, our kids, Althea and Miles, they're six years old. Um, I think we're probably the closest to Butters. Our, our, uh, the house at 212 is about uh, nine feet from our property line. Um, so, you know, we've submitted, you know, some some comments and questions in writing, and I, I won't, I'll try to keep this really brief just because it's a you know, it's been it's been a long process here. Um, I think just for our own mental health, I just wanted to state that it's been just extremely frustrating, just how hard it's been to get, um, you know, basic information during during this process. You know, I think we've had a number of questions and, you know, the applicant does point out that we've had some requests for information. And this has been really going on since last February and, and even before that. And, you know, it's been just a ton of effort to get clear answers. It took, you know, essentially eight months to get a plan that actually shows the location of that new retaining wall uh, and, and the extent of the filling that's going to be required to regrade that the rear uh, of the yard. Um, you know, this is really the first that we've seen of this major, major aspect of this project on an actual plan. Um, it's been almost a year. And, you know, it's been really quite quite hidden you know and i think you know naturally it just makes us really nervous you know that we just don't yet still have a complete picture um you know i think we're 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 nervous that we just don't know what we don't know and it's really tough for us to kind of really fully feel like we're able to assess the impact and it's just not clear exactly what's being done and it comes out and kind of drips and it's like pulling teeth sometimes and you know, I, I think that post-it note from the inspector was interesting that seems okay as long as it's built according to the Conservation Commission, you know, plans that were approved. And I guess I'm just curious if anything among all of what was submitted and reviewed by the Conservation Commission actually shows a plot where that retaining wall is. And and I I, I don't think there is, because I think we've poured over those documents trying to understand exactly what's going to happen. And I, I don't think that that's part of that, that, that package that's been approved. So it's hard to see how that's going to happen. You know, I think the the parking issue has come up and, you know, there is a plan to increase that parking area from a, a current area, I think it's 480 square feet up to around 640 square feet. So that's about by a third. And, you know, it's a spot that, you know, we, we think really does fit just, just one car. And I think our concern is that, you know, the plans still really lack detail about how this is, how this change is going to be accomplished. Um, you know, I, I would say even on the, the plot plans that say proposed plan, it still just simply says parking existing. And it may seem like a trivial issue, but that parking area is bound on one side by our property line uh, and on the other side by the property line of 218 Pleasant Street. So I think it's just really important to us that we understand exactly how the space is going to be re reconfigured and it's just m missing on, on all of the plans that we've ever seen. Um, I think you know, more importantly, we do have concerns, and I, I, I don't want them to be dismissed about the safety of actually having two cars parked there. I think, you know, with two cars parked there, there really is just not enough room for either car to, to turn around and to make a safe, uh, you know, forward-facing exit. And I think what actually happens is, you know, a driver needs to drive in reverse up, up the shared driveway, and then they need to use our driveway to, to turn around. And and I would say over the past six months or so, you know, we've seen a series of um, Airbnb guests who have been staying there. And, you know, consistently, this is what happens. You know, sometimes they'll ask my kids to like stop riding their bikes or to stop like chalk drawing on the driveway so they can use our driveway as a, as a turnaround. And so I, I just, I couldn't disagree more. Like when the applicant writes as part of the criteria for the special permit that the traffic patterns and you know, it won't be affected and impact to pedestrians won't be, you know, there will be no impact. You know, I, I, I swear, I, we, I see this, my kids see it, we see this impact like, like every day. Um, and I think having two cars there with the total inability to actually safely turn around and maneuver and make a forward exit is going to be a, a real, something that's going to make us nervous. Um, 
so I think, you know, all along we've kind of made this request that we see some detailed plans, and I think it's reasonable to see plans that actually show how that parking area will be increased by 33% and sort of logistically how a car, if there's two cars there, will, will safely turn around. And, um, you know, I know that members of the ZBA have come down previously for like a site visit. I, I would definitely welcome you to come back and bring your car and just try to maneuver in and out safely and then try to imagine it with like a second car park there. Um, it's, it's, it's really tough. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of the, you know, the difficulty getting information, and I think returning back to, I think the more fundamental point here of is what's being proposed in harmony and, and in scale with the neighborhood and with its proximity to the pond. You know, it's, it was by like a lot of effort that mostly like Sabrina figured out, you know, ambushing the town inspector and try to really understand like how you measure these things like average finished grade and what defines the story. And it was only by like a lot of effort that we figured out, you know, that the existing house is actually like a two story house. And so it's two stories and, and the project is proposing to build up and build another story on top. And, you know, the, the end result is a two story house. And I think like intuitively, there's just something really unsettling about that. There's just, it's like on a gut level, I just, I, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to kind of understand that. And I realize it's literally by like moving the earth behind the house, like increasing the elevation of the earth by about three feet or more, that this plan is going to basically enable a three-story house to be built, you know, 60, 65 feet away from the water's edge and tw 20 feet from our, our house. And I think that's why, like all of the abutters, you know, it's very close, you know, all the houses are very close to each other. And I think that's why it's elicited such a strong, um, you know, such a strong and kind of unanimous reaction, because I think just on a gut level, we realize this house is just so massive and like out of scale with 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 this neighborhood and with with the nature of being this close to the to, to the water. Um, I just have like two other two more comments and I'll wrap this up. I. I think we've all seen these plans, like since the original submission back in February, and like there's been some additions to it. There's been some clarifications. Like the plans haven't changed like one, one inch, and I think for us, it's just been this really apparent kind of lack of willingness to like listen and hear the neighbors' concerns and to try to find some sort of even sort of you know minimal sort of compromise here. You know, I think when we saw that this was coming back. Um, you know, back to the ZBA for discussion, we, you know, we, we, we thought for sure the plans must be changed in some way we could, you know, maybe re reinitiate a dialogue and, and see if there's some common ground we could find. And, you know, we reached out to, to Nelly and Mar to the, to the applicant and, you know, the response we got was, you know, happy to meet anytime, but to be clear, our plans are not changing. And, you know, I think that this is just such a departure from the way additions were done at you know 206, 210, 214, I think in all of those cases there was like input from the surrounding neighbors that was sought out and and the additions really met with their approval and, and had the support of the neighbors. I think in this case it's really just a very different different situation. Um, and the final comment I just want to make is that you know I just I wanted to stress that like we're definitely not opposed to construction. We are not opposed to change. We um, we're opposed to this project, like in its current form. You know, we've you know I mentioned we, we've had twins. They're six years old. We moved in literally um, three weeks before they were born. They've grown up in the house. They've grown up you know next to the water, wildlife. They love like the garden, outdoors, sunlight, air, all of the natural beauty of like being right here next to the pond and being in this part of Arlington. And I think when we like think about how our actions you know, affect our neighbors. And we think about like the benefits and the obligations of being part of a community. You know, I think the question of what can be done, you know, whether it's like by right or a special permit, you know, for us, that would never outweigh the consideration of what should be done because it's the right thing to do as like a neighbor and as a citizen of the town. <laughs> so I, I think you'll hear from other like neighbors tonight. I, you know, we all love our homes. We love our neighborhood but we're not we're not opposed to construction we're not opposed to doing like much needed renovations to like this cottage that needs some some love but we're opposed to the project in its current form just given the scale and the 
like disharmony and the impact to the neighborhood. Um, and that's that's really I think our our main our main issue. I, I mean, so you know, I think, um, and that's all. I think we you know we wanted to thank you for listening and being very thoughtful throughout this. It's been a really long process, um, but we really appreciate the chance to be heard. We hope that the board could use some of what's in its power to you know really encourage an outcome that would be fair to the the applicant and and fair to the neighbors and and good for the the neighborhood and the town and and that that's really it. So thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next on the list um, is uh, Show Isaac. Hi. Um, apart from my voice, I had a very bad cold. So uh, the document we saw today is actually the first I time. Your pardon, I just need to ask you to repeat your name and address for the record. Oh, okay. Um, hi, this is Show Isaac. Um, I'm a uh, 218 Pleasant Street, Arlington, um, with my husband, Ibrahim Isaac. Um, and uh, sorry for my voice, I just caught a very bad cold. <clears throat> um, also, so the document we saw today is actually the first time I saw in this long discussion over a year, I think. Um, we've been asking 212 to provide more information, and I even formed a meeting with all the neighbor together, and I asked her, can you provide more detail to us? And she said, everything was online. And I said, I didn't see any engineer plan or any other plans. So can you provide more or can you email me? Um, sadly, I didn't got anything until today. I, I mean, everything I can see is always on CBA meeting. And uh, so all the discussion or all the question or answer have to find out in this uh, on the CBA meeting as well. That's a little bit disappointing and frustrating. Um, so a few things I would like to address. First of all, parking. The picture that 212 showed on the right side of the red arrow she point is actually belongs to 218. That's our property. And then we find a surveyor that put a nail on it. So the whole parking space not belongs to 212. There's a partial belongs to 218. So yes, they can park two cars but they have really big trouble to turn around. Um, like John just mentioned, their Airbnb guest and even their tenant has a, a lot of trouble to, don't say turn around, just park one car, one SUV over there. We have a, a lot of their guests, their tenant has to use our shared driveway or even our own driveway. Um, There's one instance that their Airbnb guest has to park in my entrance of my driveway and block it for minutes and I cannot get out and I have to just wait there and uh, that's not okay so um another thing is let's no answer about 10 feet setback of right side staircase tour to 218 property they're gonna build a, a staircase tour tour uh, I mean tour to our property but on the plant or application they submit before um, the number was changed a lot. Sometimes it says 13 feet, sometimes it said nine feet. So today that this question is not get answered. Uh, another thing is 212 expressed that 21A was claimed their property without communicating with them. Uh, on that picture, there's an orange flag pole over there. On the right side actually belongs to us. All we do, we didn't clean that thing. All we do, we just take out the fence that was marked wrong by previous owner. And also, I wish um, they did mention that they also come to our property to train our tree without communicating with us. That actually, I almost called a cop for that. Um, so I don't understand that why I trying to form more multiple meetings and get more details or uh, plans from 212, but I never get it. And I only can get in CBA meeting. Um, it's frustrating and uh, it's sadly, and uh, all my concern was not addressed as well. So I don't know what else I can you know, say or trying to push forward to be more nice neighbor to 212. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next on the list, um, is Rebecca Gruber. 
Good evening. Thank you for letting me um, speak on this matter. Rebecca Gruber, 215 Pleasant Street. So I live directly across the street from where all of this will be happening. Um, Pleasant Street's a busy street, so a lot is always going on in Pleasant Street. Um, and again, as has been reiterated, I don't think anyone's opposed to the changes, although um, the process of construction, et cetera, will be burdensome on everyone. I'm now concerned, though, about this issue of the second car. Um, there is almost no parking on Pleasant Street. In fact, the parking that's available starts right outside my driveway. And there are often cars parked across the street um, because there's tree work happening, somebody's getting a driveway paved, somebody has guests. Um, if this second car um, doesn't fit well down at um, the 212 property and is going to end up being parked in the very few spaces available on Pleasant Street on an ongoing basis, this will be a huge problem. Um, technically, I do not believe you're allowed to park there all day, but the police don't have the time to come check that. And certainly we don't wanna be bothering them with that. So it's very important that there be appropriate parking on people's um, private areas and not have constant parking on the few spots available on Pleasant Street for all of the neighbors to use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next on our list is Ms. Aikenhead, but I, do you want to speak now or do you want to, I, I was going to have you come back once we're, I've heard more comments. Yeah, I can wait. I can wait. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, then the next on the list is Chia Yun Sun. Hi. Uh, thank you. So my name is Chayun Jessica Sun. I live in 216 Pleasant Street uh, with my husband, Matt Dawson. And unfortunately, he can't join us on the call today. Um, so I will, I have three main things I want to address. And some of this might be a repeat of what's been talked about. And I'll try to be brief because we've uh, heard some of them already. And um, I think the first one is really the communication piece that um, other two of others had talked about. Although um, Nellie and Mark are open to have conversations, but um, I often uh, felt kind of dismissed and found that they are not really open to receive our feedback or address some of the concern that we posed back in March this year. Uh, we've all had our letters and lists of concerns. And again, like this is really nothing personal against Nellie and Mark. I, I do want to kind of respond to a couple of points that was talked about. I think um, Nellie mentioned the bar graph, and I'm sorry, I'm not very good at the technicality, but the bar graph of the percentage of the footprint of the house to the uh, land. Um, and I want to just point out that the the different houses that was shown was specifically lakefront, like uh, kind of immediate abutters and in our neighborhood. Um, but we think like the lakefront um, property were kind of important to talk about. Um, and then the other minor point is, um, I think one of the plan that was showed is the con is similar to what was presented to the conservation committee in 2022, um, but one of the pictures that was in that, that was very recent, I think that was sh uh, shown with a, a 218th uh, kind of um, taking away some of the invasive species. I think those pictures were pretty recent. So I was just curious, are there more submissions? Like are there updated submissions we should be aware of? Um, and I would really share like what, um, John at 214 had mentioned like, it's pretty unsettling for us because it's really like the minor technicality of what counts as a floor. Um, so it's a finished average grade, whether that now does not count as a floor. I think that that really does feel pretty unsettling. Um, and I think the second point I to talk about, um, again, it might be repeat with what some of the concern that's mentioned, but this has specific 
impact to our house to 16 Plaza industry because we do have deeded easement that goes to the lake. And that easement would uh, go by, I think, uh, Nally's property before Show's property. So it's kind of two different properties, but we have a six feet wide easement. And we're pretty concerned about how these new proposed plan will impact that because um, I just want to point out in the updated plot survey that was uploaded um, last week, still does not show um, the side stack side steps that was in, um, I believe in the, the plotted plan, uh, but it was not shown when like uh, in the survey where, um, because in the survey there is our easement, but we don't know how far the addition will go, might go into our easement. So that's something we've been requesting, we'd really like to see. Um, so that's about steps. And another one is really the parking plan that you've heard many times. I don't, because it's not shown on the survey, so we don't quite know how the 480 square feet current plan is, is uh, indicated. And also like what would the, more importantly, what would the proposed plan? That's still something unclear to us. And we just really want to avoid getting into any kind of issues in the future, so I would really like to see that. And that's, again, tied to the DEDA easement. And I think, um, finally, um, it's really about the history and the characters of the neighborhood. Um, so we live in 216 Pleasant Street, and I think next year it will be, our house will be 170 years old. And if you think of our cul-de-sac, um, I believe our house is the first one that was built. Um, I feel proud and also a lot of responsibility. Um, as some of you know, like an old house comes with a lot of work and we're incredibly cognizant of the responsibility. I do feel like I want to maintain the character of our house and also the neighborhood. Um, and I think the proposed plan, I don't wanna repeat everything we stated in our letter, it's on the docket, um, we really believe the proposed plan is completely out of proportion, proportion um, even though it's stated as a three bedroom home. If you look at the details, I think there's enough of an alcove. It's really a four bedroom house. Um, and like as some of the abutter has said, um, yeah, we can't disagree more and really think this will negatively impact the health, our mental health, uh, the morale, character, history, and integrity of this neighborhood, and that preserving that is extremely important to us. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, next on our list um, is uh, Steve Moore. Well, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, I must say I am impressed by the um, strength of feeling that uh, the speakers are all talking with, and, and, and it's um, clearly important to, to folks. I am not an abutter. Um, I'd like to ask for you, Mr. Chair, uh, of the applicant. Uh, she had chosen pictures of the uh, concrete cinder block steps that are going to be replaced by a more landscape set of steps that had erosion on one side of the picture and also a picture was shown of some cleared area, which she claimed had been cleared uh, without approval since it was her land. Um, I'd like to know a little more about that. Did that occur? I mean, we just heard from the last speaker that they have an easement. Now an easement doesn't allow folks to modify the land that they have an easement over, but it does allow them to, to pass on it. And I'm wondering, uh, does the owner feel that they performed something illegal when they did what they did? And furthermore, why did, I guess I don't understand why, even though it's an easement, why they would feel that the, the abutters were allowed to put in stairs. I don't, I don't understand that. Is that, was that, is my understanding clear of what I thought was presented? Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, I would ask Ms. Aikenhead. Um, so the concrete steps that were put in um, were those put in before or after you purchased the property? 
Okay, so the concrete steps, I believe, were there before we bought the property. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure. The clearing of the land next to that was after we bought the property just recently. In no, our Sorry, if you're facing the pond, looking down the stairs, was the yeah. area that was cleared to the right of that or to the left of that? So the stair, the, the, to the right of the stairs. Okay, thank you. So, so honestly, we didn't want to make a fuss about either thing, but it's kind of, we're in a tough spot because we're getting so much fuss about what we want to do to fix it, which is really just to be nice to the neighbors because we don't need that ourselves for access. We just thought we want to get rid of that, those concrete blocks and put in something better so that 216, which is the big house that has the easement, can get to the pond. So it's not something we have to do. It's something that we thought would be nice to do. The easement, different easements have different terms. 216 has an easement to pass and repass on foot to go to the pond. They don't have an easement to build steps. They don't have an easement to store boats. They don't have an easement to make any improvements, but they have the right to pass and repass. We wanted to make it a little nicer for them. There are other easements on this property, including one that we have, which is an easement to use the driveway and the right of ways for all purposes that roads are, are in, include, including laying conduit, paving and repaving, putting in gas lines, putting in electricity. Our easement that we have to get from our house to Pleasant Street is very different than the easement that 216 has to get to the pond. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. Mr. Warren, Chairman, did that address your question? Uh, that answers my question. And so the steps that are going to be installed by the applicant, uh, as shown in the, the shared screen right now, is for the use of both the applicant and the neighbors you, uh, availing themselves of the easement. Correct. I don't think we really will need them because we have direct pond access, but we could use them. Okay, thank you. And, and lastly, uh, I... I I also heard Airbnb get mentioned a number of times, and I don't know if that was in relation to the applicant's property or one of the other neighbors. Uh, this is going to be an owner-occupied property, correct? Okay, so here's there's two different Airbnbs going on. On our property, we had an air we had it was empty for six months while we were going through this process. It cost us that cost us fifteen thousand dollars. So. We put it on Airbnb. We had it rented for a couple of months. We now have longer term tenants in there. Our intent was to move down there. This has been a very contentious and unpleasant process for us. So I don't know if we will actually move down there. We might end up doing something else. Shao and Abraham in the blue house next door to us have two Airbnbs in their own house that have nothing to do with us. Okay. All right, that, that, that clears it up for me. This is certainly a complicated case, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so when the chair opened the public comment period, um, he in included a direction to try to address the issues that make the this, that give the board the information that it needs to have in order to decide the case. And at least from my point of view, uh, disputes back and forth about the easement and what the easement covers and whether anyone has intruded on the easement, um, those are legal things. We always kind of assume that for our purposes that the, that the private legal issues have been addressed. And I am not sure that there is anything that was said, although it was very heartfelt and obviously people are have had uh, experiences which are not particularly pleasant for them. Um, they're not helping me. Uh, and the, we've gone pretty long already. Um, and what we need to understand better is what we is what uh, how all of this fits into the statute that we're trying to, uh, in force. Um, and I'd just like to encourage the people who continue to uh, talk to us to to focus on that. Uh, um, I have been impressed by the willingness of some of the neighbors who have each said that they would be prepared to do some sort of compromise. Uh, they at least talk about something that would be a modification. That would be a useful thing 
uh, to at least further discuss. But beyond that, we need to understand what it is that that uh, is going on here that will affect um, and how it will affect the, uh, the, the, the criteria that we have to apply. And I just like to encourage people to focus on that issue because that's the issue that will, that's the discussion that will be most helpful to the board. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so next on the speakers list um, is uh, Tamara Joseph. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. I think I'm the last of the abutters. Um, I'm in 210 Pleasant Street, so on the lake right next to 212. Um, uh, that uh, the current home is uh, 10 feet from uh, the property line, and there are 22 feet that separate the two homes. Um, my husband and I and our son moved here in June 2008, so 15 plus years uh, enjoying the pond. My son was five at the time. He's grown up and gone to college now. Um, we have watched additions be built at 206 and 208 over the past 15 years. Um, the experience there was different. It was a much more um, collegial and interactive process. Um, we are very concerned about the proposed bill. Like, like others here, we are not against this property being developed, being improved. Um, but what is being proposed, we believe will um, negatively impact the enjoyment of our home and the neighborhood in general. Uh, this is a unique neighborhood with historic importance where the homes are extremely close together. The plans for 212, if approved by the ZBA, would negatively impact our views, privacy, and noise levels, both inside and outside the home. We are also worried that it might impact the foundation of the home, given the close proximity of the homes, either through change drainage, replacement of the, this retaining wall, the details of which we are just learning, or the greater weight of this new structure. I've submitted a letter which notes how the proposed plans are inconsistent with Arlington design guidelines and bylaws. The problems posed by these plans appear to be precisely what animated the creation of those design guidelines so that Arlington's older homes would not be replaced by new homes that were outsized and inharmonious with the surrounding neighborhood. I have submitted photos taken from the lake showing the shoreline. And of course, the um, ZBA has also taken the time to see this area for itself and um, appreciate the impact that this proposed home would have on the harmony of this neighborhood. Finally, um, I will mention the applicants have never sought to meet with my husband and I, although we are the residents who have lived here the longest. Uh, we, are, we are renters and not homeowners, um, but uh, I believe that we still have an interest here. We are not going anywhere in long time here. Uh, nevertheless, we have continued to engage in this dialogue, requesting additional information regarding drainage, elevation, window placement, parking spaces, landscaping, and hardscaping. That information is still not complete, despite the very long time that the application has been pending and the numerous submissions that have occurred. We therefore urge the CBA to reject this application for all of the reasons that have been cited. And we thank everyone for your time and attention to this important matter. Thank you. Uh, looking at the speakers list, um, the only other hand is Mr. Moore seeking a second time. Uh, Mr. Moore. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, second time around. Uh, I, I want to thank Mr. Handel for his comment. 
uh, he, he's right about redirection and refocus. And I, I apologize for taking the conversation away from the decision at home. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, are there any further members of the public who wish to address this hearing this evening? And it's, there was one or two other hands that were up before, but were taken down. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware. I do not see any additional hands. Um, I do see a wave. Um, Ms. Sun, did you wish to, to speak? No? Okay. Looking through the screen. Do not see anyone else. Okay, with that then, I will go ahead and close the public comment here, uh, portion of the hearing. Um, so that brings us back to the board. So again, uh, just to reiterate, we had to start. So this is a, excuse me, a request for a special permit for a large addition under section 542B6. Um, in addition to the regular um, findings, which the board needs to make, which are in section 333, the board has three additional findings it needs to make. Uh, it would need to find that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. It would need to consider whether the dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses are appropriate and consider the conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, the the abutters and the neighbors and the other residents have, have said this is a fairly unique uh, situation in town. Um, I think it's pretty obvious at one point there would have been one house with a lot of shore access and that has been subdivided into a number of smaller parcels, um, all of which are very close together um, and really very intertwined in terms of access to them um, and sort of moving in and about the the district and then also in terms of access to the shoreline that there are easements that are in place to preserve um to preserve access and then these this situation is really fairly unique to this set of like four or five houses and then once you uh start moving um towards the center again they become the much longer larger lots um with one or two one or two buildings upon them so um, there were several themes, um, I think Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I was kind of hoping that there'd be an opportunity for board discussion before we got into the summary of the case. And, uh, I wondered if we could do that. If Mr. Ms. Aiken had, had previously yep. deferred answering some things, uh, until the, uh, the commentary was all over. And I at least have a few questions that I'd like to ask. Oh, her. absolutely. No, I just want to reiterate what the board needs to do. And then I was going to go right now to sort of pull out some of the things that were mentioned several times. Well, that would be fine. I'm, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't rush pie. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so there were a lot of concerns, uh, specifically about the, the parking and how the parking would work, um, both in terms of how it would be accommodated on the site and how it could be navigated by a, uh, by one or two vehicles. Um, there were concerns uh, about the preservation of the easement um, and how that would be achieved. Uh, there were a lot of concerns that sort of about the process, how we got to this point, um, various things about communication, uh, you know, sort of uh, keeping everyone informed and things like that um, that were brought forward. Um, and then there were also um, towards the end, a couple of concerns regarding um, sort of the appearance of the building in regards to its historic character, the historic character of the neighborhood um, and uh, the, the proximity of the houses and sort of how that proximity can cause issues in regards to um uh privacy and views and the like uh, so i believe those were the, the main things that were brought up and with that i would 
uh, Mr. Hanlon, I would ask you if you're. So I okay. wonder if if we, we could put up the plan that shows where the parking is or will be or both. Let me cycle through all my plans here. Um, here's one. So on this, this is from the application that was submitted to the Conservation Commission. Um, and currently this is the, the portion here that's identified as existing parking. Um, is it possible to, um, to increase the scale here so that we can see that, focus in on that particular area? Sure. Um, not a hundred percent exactly what is in your view, but let me. Um, is that better? Okay, that helps. Um, so what I would like, it's it it doesn't help nearly as much as one of the exhibits that that one of the applicants put in, which which made it bigger. But you can sort of see where this is, and I wonder if Ms. Aikenhead could show um how this fits in with the neighbor the the what where specifically any shared aspect of this parking um uh is located and exactly where the extra two, as i understand it from the material submitted to the conservation commission the idea is to increase the width of this by two feet and i would like her to show us where uh, where that would be essentially outlined for us what the what the actual driveway will be lo look like after it has been enlarged um, using this as a template. I can do that. So basically, we don't have like a lot of leeway or play down here. The, the parking right now is fairly close to John and Sabrina's next door. What we wanted to do, because it is very tight, as they've pointed out time and time again, was in so far as it's relatively level, is just straighten this out a bit against our house and on the far side of everybody else's property, just to make it a tad bit wider and a little bit easier to get in and out of. We can right now park this, the easement that the 216 has to get to the pond is here we can pull two cars in here already and be off the we, we, excuse me Ms. Aiken, when you say here at least i'm not seeing any oh yeah so oh, this is i saw a little happens. arrow but i don't okay i think i have to share my screen to do it um okay. that would be, so, that'd be fine with that will be fine with me so let me go ahead and um, okay stop my sharing here okay all right go ahead I have to zoom in. Can you see that? Is it big enough? No. Okay. So in the upper left there, there's a zoom percentage too on the. Oh yeah. Okay. Would you do like two hundred? Yeah. Is that good? A little more. Okay. So this okay, is, the, can you see my arrow now? Yes. Okay, so this is the existing parking area. It pretty much goes along the property line right here. It's very tight. It is difficult to maneuver, though it's possible. So what our idea was to just make it, we can't go too far because the land drops off, but to widen it out on this side, which is away from the neighbors, and to straighten it out a bit over here, which is by our house to add some extra maneuverability. This land, this right here is the easement footpath that 216 has to pass a repass on foot. We are already able to pull two cars in here and be out of their way. But if we had a little bit more space, it would be a little bit easier. 
we do understand that the, the easement is legally binding and we are not going to interfere with that in any way because of course we cannot. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I we have the sort of disadvantage that the record in this case is just for this case, and it doesn't include some of the other things we know from from the other case. And I think that that I I just like to observe that that what we learned when we went to the walkthrough. Uh, also included issues that I think are continue to be important in which I think everybody is assuming that uh, we'll keep in mind. One one of those has to do with uh, constructability. Uh, the it, It's a tight fit in there and it's a little difficult to get larger trucks through. And I think that uh, maybe Mr. Riccardelli or others uh, re remarked on that and um, it, certainly, it is true that that one of the issues that is not being talked about a great deal, but which matters, I think, a lot in the overall scheme of things, is the effect that the uh, building will have on the view, particularly of Mr. Garber's property, but maybe the views of the lake uh, with respect to some others. And those are <clears throat> those are issues that are actually issues in the case. Um, we haven't heard as much about them in in this hearing, but we heard quite a lot about them in hearings on the previous application. Um, and uh, I, uh, if if Mr. Cunningham uh, approves of this, but I'd like to sort of incorporate by reference the uh, uh, material that were submitted in the other case and the uh, testimony, so that um, we're not forced to try to figure out when we want to rely on something which which is the occasion on which we heard it mr cunningham is that an appropriate thing to do as long as i uh, think mr chair please uh, michael cunningham acting town council i think mr hamlin's suggestion would certainly be helpful as long as those materials were at least at a later point made part of the record Yes, I think I'm only referring to the things that were actually part of the record in that earlier case. And I think that's uh, it would be helpful for the board. I, I believe Mr. Hamlin's suggestion is a good one and is permissible, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So if I guess we may have to sort of make sure we have consent that we do that. But I, I do think that it's important to keep uh, much of that in mind because you know, we've talked a lot about the process and obviously people have proceeded in this case in a way in which has not certainly calmed everyone's nerves. Uh, but when it comes down to it, there are some specific things that uh, are that pose difficulties here. And uh, and I, I just mentioned uh, some of them. One of the things I'd like to uh, also ask Ms. Aikenhead about um We've had a lot of back and forth about stories and the and the magically disappearing story. Uh, and of course, that's not magically disappearing because of any magic that anyone of, of any age manages to make real life stuff go away. It has to do with the peculiarities of the way in which our law is written. Um, and in some ways, the impact, the physical impact that this will have on visibility and on the neighborhood in general here um, is likely to have to do with the actual height in feet rather than the height in stories. And I wonder if Mrs. A if Ms. Aikenhead could uh, um, uh, could comment on that. How how tall is this uh, compared to what the what it is required and uh, and in view of its location uh, with respect to the uh, neighboring properties. Okay, so our roof line is 26 uh, feet, I think one inch, which is nine feet below the maximum 35 foot that's allowed by right, significantly lower than it's allowed by right. I, it's probably roughly equal to John and Sabrina's property. I don't know exactly because I haven't measured that. The thing about the stories, like, if the basement was considered a story, like that ma number did magically appear and then it did magically disappear, you we can still we could have two and a half stories by right, so we can still have a half story on the second floor 
And a half story isn't defined as half height, it's defined as half of the square footage above the floor below being seven feet tall or lower. So in reality, if the board concludes that it is a story in the basement, which I don't think it is, but that's okay. We can still have two and a half stories. I think the view to the neighbors isn't going to change because we just have to reconfigure the second floor a little bit to reduce the size so there's only 50% of the floor below at seven feet or higher. So, Mr. Chairman, the reason I raise this is is I'm not too concerned. I mean, it seems to me that that I, I've seen, heard no reason to doubt the way in which uh, inspectional services has treated the um, has has treated the uh, height and stories. I just think that height and stories is a is not the right thing to be looking at when you're looking at neighbor at the actual impact on the neighborhood. It's something that we would that would have been very important to us if that story hadn't disappeared. We would have had a proposal to for a new nonconformity that would have made this a much different case. But it it isn't that. Um, but it, it does involve a question of of uh, of the neighborhoods. Now, one of the things I think that the board ought to remember is that the reason why it is that we have, at least in my view, the reason why it is the way we have a special provision for large additions is the possibility that by proceeding to do things that an, a, a homeowner has the right to do, um, it could be in a situation where everything is built out, have an unfair and unreasonable impact on neighbors. And so you're looking particularly at the uh, at butters and what the, and what those impacts uh, on what it, those impacts uh, uh, would be. And they have an importance that even is more important, I think, than the than it has in a normal case, because it is the it is figuring out the reasonableness of what people whether proposal is in a fair on fairly narrow scope that uh is that we're we're asked to look at we'll be asked to look at the general neighborhood in the community when we do 3.3.3 but the special things about the large addition have to do with the way in which uh, uh buildings in close proximity uh, may affect uh one another um, and so it's it's i think important to both understand that the uh, story that this is not that high, but it is high enough to actually interfere with uh, with you. And I don't think that there's any dispute that some interference is likely to take place, uh, at least with respect to the Garber property and perhaps with respect uh, with respect to others. Um, so I'm going to let it. I, I'm going to stop monopolizing people's attention right now. But I do think that it's important to focus in on the way in which this will fit into the neighborhood and the degree to which others in the neighborhood will be adversely affected by some of the things that Ms. Aikenhead would otherwise have had a right to do, but she doesn't have a right to do if, if she needs a special permit. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Are there other members of the board who have comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hoffman. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up um, the sort of last bit of what Mr. Hannon was saying, specifically with regards to views, um, because it does seem clear that there's some impact to the views on the certain adjacent properties. But uh, I, th I think there's kind of an active question in my mind about what degree of impact is reasonable and uh, it's not as if there are <clears throat> clearly protected view rights here. Hmm. So I just, I'm curious to hear from other members of the board at exactly um, how to assess that impact. Great, thank you. Um, go ahead. I'm just going to stop the share here so I can see more of the screen. Uh, 
Um, are there other members of the board who wish to? Those questions, okay. Um, Mr. Chair. Ms. Riccadelli. I, I do have a question um, uh, regarding the retaining walls. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm sort of understanding uh, the the extent of the retaining walls. I think uh, if I could ask the applicant, Mr. Chair, that yep. there was uh, a retaining wall shown on the original plan that kind of comes off the house. And in the floor plans of the basement, it says to rebuild that retaining wall. I think on the plot plan that we just looked at with the purple lines, there's an additional retaining wall that's sort of in, in the on the lake side of the house as well. So are there two tiers of retaining walls? And uh, if you could just explain, uh, Ms. Aikenhead, uh, what the construction, I, I think you showed a um, section of what one of those was, but if you could just explain uh, what those two walls are, I think it would be helpful for me in, in understanding the grading on the site. Sure, I can do that. If, if you want, I can reshare my screen. But basically, right now, the back of the house has a foundation that then turns into a retaining wall where the house ends. So that will be new foundation. And then that wall turns. So if you're in the back of the house and you're going left towards the easement, oh, okay, let me use. Yeah, there we go. Oh, so right now there, this is the back of the house. Oh, Christian, maybe you can yep. show them. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. So this is the existing retaining wall that Correct. is included. And they're on all the linked together. So, but the back of the house where the addition is will turn into foundation. Yeah. I don't know if we'll need that the extension to go out to where the wall turns, but that wall that turns is the one that's being undermined by those cinder block steps. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, there's a huge drop off. We have to rebuild that because we have to have something there. It's not a new wall, it's gonna be rebuilt. The level might have to change a little bit, but it will need to, to, be, to be redone. So, so, so Mr. Chair, if I, if I yeah, may. Please. Um, so um, that top foundation wall, so a portion of that will now be the foundation of the house. So I'm assuming a concrete or you know a, a structured wall there. So, and then the rest will be potentially a concrete wall as well, or would it also now be a block wall? So, okay, so the wall, but that's behind the house right now mm -hmm. is concrete. It's about five feet tall. It goes from <laughs> the proposed, the place that says proposed two-story addition over to the easement. That's concrete already. Some mm -hmm. of it will be replaced by foundation. Some of it will still be retaining wall. Okay. Then where it turns, it will be probably concrete, but it could be anything really. The additional retaining wall that's two or three feet high is out at the edge where the purple lines are. Mm -hmm. So that is new to bring up the grade so that there can be a patio back there, which the Conservation Commission approved, and so that we can have footings for the deck. That's the, that is a new wall, but it's low and it's porous, and we propose a gabion wall, but it could be something similar to that. Okay. Okay, that's that's very helpful. I think that uh, just understanding how those those two things are interacting was sort of yeah. confusing to me, uh, yeah. and and I think you know on one of the uh, the floor plans for the I think the basement of the the proposed the extent of that wall looks different than the overall site plan, um, and I was wondering if that was being you know cut back or or. Uh, reduced in order to get the parking in, or if that is maybe just a oh, no, no, that's way behind the house. So, so show so me yes. where. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, the one that the chair just pulled up on the screen, the extent of that wall just looks a little, um, a little different, but maybe that's just because the addition comes out uh, much further. Oh, are you house. talking about to the right of the house or in the <laughs> back? This, this leg here yeah. on the so I don't know for sure, like there is a wall there. It's not exactly that shape. I think that's kind of a rough rendering as opposed to an accurate display because the wall in the survey has a little bit of a kink in it. It's not straight. There will be something pretty much like that pretty much out there. It depends on how we're going to deal with the steps and the erosion and the, the change in grade that's that, that's there. 
Okay, that's the very back wall that the back of the house that's going to stay the same we're not we can't go any further into the resource area than we already are so that wall will be in the exact same place okay thank you thank you mr chair you're welcome um so is there sort of a final set of landscape plans that show the entire proposal, including the revised parking area, the location of all the retaining walls, the location of the house, the front steps, and all that. Is there a, a prepared plan that includes all that information, Ms. Aikenhead? No, there isn't. I okay. have a land management plan that shows the vegetation and the plantings in the back the patios and all, but it's more of a rendering than an exact plan. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of play to move where the parking is. As I said, we're going to straighten it out. It's going to be there. We can't go any further because it drops off and we're not going down to the drop off, but we haven't drawn it all out in a plan. Mm -hmm. Because like in this plan here, you know, the, the parking we know is somewhere in this area, but it's not well defined. Um, and we know that there's a landing and steps somewhere in this area that's similarly not well defined. Um, right. I mean, you we, might, if you go down to the architect's plan, you can see where that stuff is, but right. I think. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, unfortunately, there are several aspects of this, and some of them that are seem to be fairly critical to, to the, the, the plan itself and the functionality that are missing from the plan at this point. Right. Um, I just wanted to confirm that I wasn't looking in the wrong place. No. Okay. Mr. I mean, Mr. We, we can have things added, I guess, like, in my mind, it, everything's going to be on our property within like a foot of where it is now. We're not going on the abutters. We're not going in the easement. We're not going against the Conservation Commission. We're not going against the Historic District Commission. But like mm -hmm. moving earth around in this type of space. It's really, we could draw up a plan and have it be exact to the inch, but it might, in reality, it's probably not going to turn out that way because it's very complicated to get to do it ahead of time as opposed to working with what's there as we build. Yeah. No, it's just, it's hard to assess, you know, exactly where the build, where the parking is. Is there sufficient space clear of the easement? Um, and trying to get an understanding of sort of how the vehicles would move. Um, yeah. were... I mean, there's sufficient space clear of the easement now. So when we make it bigger, it's only going to be better. We, 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 have, we have had two cars down there many mm -hmm. times in and out. Um, okay. And then the, this retaining wall, the one that's the, the one that has the jog in it over by yep. the easement. That can't go any further than the easement because the easement's the easement and we can't interfere with that. So okay. we have like what a foot there to play around with. Maybe that's it. We know we can't interfere with that easement. We right. we know we can't do anything on anybody else's property. Mm -hmm. We can I mean we could draw it all out, but okay. Mr. Mr. Hammer, Chairman. Yes. Yeah, I would like to just from from the point of view of of what happens. Suppose suppose this is approved, it will be approved uh, subject to um, a condition that requires uh, the pl plan that's executed to be consistent with uh, or be the plan that is before the board. And we're in a situation where. Um, we have no one plan that shows that we have testimony that indicates where something may be, but that's not the same thing that you can present to ISD and say, okay, this is what was on the proposed plan. And at the very least, I think we need to have something put together that is unambiguously what the proposed plan is. That doesn't have to be all one piece of paper. Uh, you could say there's a landscape plan and that counts too. Uh, and you could conceivably incorporate by reference some part of plans that were before the Conservation Commission or pull them out. But either way, at the end of the day, you have to have something that's unambiguous so that the inspector can decide whether or not what's being proposed is consistent with what was approved. And that's difficult to do if you have to look at lots of different places and if you have to sort of 
imagine as we do with the parking exactly uh, where that would go. And, and I, I would say that that um, it's true from Ms. Aikenhead's point of view that the, what they already have works for two cars, but it isn't equally true from Mr. Garber's point of view that it works for two cars. And there's testimony that that the current situation has caused some inconvenience in the neighborhood as well. And, and we have to take all that into account. So it is certainly would be helpful to understand the way in which the expansion of the parking space uh, might alleviate the difficulty that Mr. Garber and others have observed. It would also be helpful. Uh, I, I can't tell. Is the is the is this dashed line the easement? Is that what this is? Is Aiken head? Is this the edge of the easement? This dashed line here on the plan. You're muted. Oh, Nelly, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay, so that dash line is the easement. That's the easement for the 216 to pass and repass on foot. You can see if okay. you go towards the pond, our property jogs in by six feet. Yep. That, and then after that, there's an easement for 216 to pass and repass, but it's on uh, 218's property. Okay. And our, we have an easement ourselves onto 218's property beyond our own property by six feet. So see how there's that dotted line? If you go to the corner of our property, just mm -hmm. to the right of 60.5, yes, there. We have six additional feet going into 218's land to drive, pass and repass, and park our cars. So okay. it's bigger than it seems. That whole width is accessible for us to us for all purposes that all roads are used for. Okay. Right, but you would not be able to, you wouldn't be able to, obviously wouldn't be able to park there or park in the easement, but you have that, you're saying you have that for maneuverable space in order right. to- Right, exactly, okay. exactly. And it's right now, that right now, that so there's, tw well, there's a 12 foot wide easement. So, some of that is on our land. When you cross over, it's on John Garber's land. And so there's, see that thing that says 12 foot ride right yep. away? Half of that is on 218's land. Half of that is on 214 land. It's our right to pass and repass. Right now, about eight feet of that is paved. So there's an additional four feet that we have access to that is not currently paved. Okay. So like okay. we can maneuver with an eight foot thing. We're fine with it. But if the neighbors start making a fuss about how dangerous it is, it is, we can widen it out to our full 12 feet so that we cut the danger. Okay. Is, is this portion of the plan here is, this is an actual roadway, correct? This so is that, no, that is also labeled right of way, which to me looks like it benefited our property at some point in time, but we have not pursued that. It's underneath okay. their deck right now. Ah, okay, I see. Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I, I have a couple of questions as well. Do we have a front view from the front going down to the lake or the pond? I have a front elevator. Oh, if you do, then I will stop sharing. I can share my screen. I'll ask you to put that up. I'm going to have a lot of views, but... You might have to, is this far enough away or did you want further back? I was really looking to see what it looked like from the Garber's property, if there's okay. a view. So, the, uh, yeah, I can back up. I have to get a different photo out. This is like started right here is the edge of the Garber's property. This, I think, is the property line, the blue line, and this is the street going down. Because ah. if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, when we mm -hmm. visited, um, you, I remember standing on the Garber's deck and asking the question about what was proposed at the time where it was going to extend upward and you know how far to the side to the right as we were standing on the deck and i remember miss aiken had uh saying you know what it was going to be the dimensions i don't recall what they were 
but I was trying to visualize it in terms of, you know, what the visual impact would be. And as Ms. Hoffman had alluded to, there's no specific um, view easement in our bylaw. So it sort of gets carried over into the questions, I suppose, about whether or not the structure is in harmony with the you know rest of the neighborhood, et cetera. Um, but I guess my question is, if Ms. Aikenhead can recall what the dimensions were at the time that we visited, what is the addition going upward on that right-hand side going to look like in terms of how much higher it's going to go than the existing roof line? Um, you know, how much farther out it's going to go to the right as you're viewing it from the front. Um, so that I'm really asking for a comparison between what's being proposed now and what was being proposed then. Because I had an, a, an idea, a very vague idea, quite frankly, of what it would look like if I was standing on the Garber's deck. Right. So in terms of going from this corner right here out to the right, the addition is about five feet. So most of the addition, there's an L behind the house right here. The vast majority of the addition is behind that L. So yep. first floor level wouldn't be seen. It goes out to about here. There, because their porch is kind of over here, it's a tangential view. I don't think they would see the first floor too much. The second floor will be new and higher. So that will be visible. And and so there was a comment made, Mr. Chairman, um, about, you know, in the event, and, and by the way, I think that the work that's been done uh, with regard to what's a story and what's not a story has been, is fairly definitive, you know, according to the calculations that have been made, that have been revised, that have been reviewed by the town. So for purposes of discussion, I think that it is not a story down there. Um, However, I know Ms. Aiken had made the reference to the fact that even if it were a story, that she'd been be entitled to build a half story where uh, she was proposing to build upward, and that she'd have to keep it to, you know, under fifty percent of the floor below, and it couldn't if only fifty percent could be seven feet or above. So I'm just wondering if that was built rather than what you're proposing, what would the difference be in terms of the square footage on that level? Do you know? If, if you understand my question. Can you say that again? Yeah, so, so I think you had said that even if the basement was considered a story, that you could still go up a half oh, story. Right. Right. And and so, you know, because of the requirements for 50% and seven feet, all of that, I'm wondering, because you, you've got 930 square feet that you're talking about, right, for this, right. as right. is proposed. How much different would it be if that top level was just built as a half story based upon okay. that calculation? Okay, if, so if this, you know. these are rough numbers, but like right now the proposed first floor, I believe is 1175. So let's just say it's 1200, right? Yep. 50% of that would be 600. That means 50% of this second floor, could, 600 square feet could be seven feet tall or higher. Yes. So the rest of it has to have enough of a slope so that it's under seven feet. So, so the other 600 has to be under seven feet. Right now, because we have a, a cathedral ceiling dining room, we have 999 feet. So somehow we'd have to get rid of 399 feet, which we could do by stepping it all back and doing, for example, a roof deck on the, on the pond side. All right, I was just trying My to get- My point it. is like, yeah. like, first of all, well, I wanna get into this. We haven't tried to compromise because we have, but if we had to do that, it wouldn't make one bit of difference to the neighbors in terms of height of the building, views or anything else. Okay, thank you. And I did, I think I pulled up, I pulled up my historic district commission. There's an interesting, uh, I have to just find it, but I have a little indicator that shows how high, how much higher our roof is going, which is about 10 feet relative to the garbage, if I can find it. 
Так что я не могу ее сделать. Вот так. I mean, the Historic District Commission is a pretty picky bunch. They did analyze the scale and massing of this house pretty extensively. Okay. But you can, I, I don't want to hold you up, so you can do something else while I'm looking. This is just an indicator from the street. That's the Garbers. This is Shaw and Abrahams. This is the 216 Pleasant Street. Our house is below this. And, and we, I, we, had to put a, we put a pole up on the roof to show where the roof line is going to be. And it's somewhere like just barely visible from these trees. So it's lower than their house still, but it's higher than it is now. Whatever you just described, we do not see. I know, you can't see it because I've got to find the right picture. Oh, okay. Sorry. Mr. Dubon, did you have further questions? Uh, no, that was it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. We I apologize for interjecting. I was hoping to be um, acknowledged just very briefly. My name is Sarah Radigan. I'm the, um, the attorney for John uh, Garber and Sabrina Howe. Um, okay. You are aware that we had a public comment period earlier this evening? I do. And I just wanted to interject briefly to ask if the board would like to see um, either a photo or video that um, my clients do have that um, that will show you at least the, obviously the existing uh, view from their property line. Um, the, you know, uh, the various board members um, questions about the impact from their property have seemed to be important. And I was going to ask that one if they were able to share the photographs or video, that would be helpful. Um, and two, to request that if this board is gonna request additional information from the um, petitioners, that it would be very helpful to our clients to see um, a view rendering, um, not fancy, it doesn't have to be you know super fancy, but something that would show um, what the impact would be from the perspective of um, the neighboring lot. Um, and this is really due to the fact that the the massing of that second floor structure is right, you know, nine feet from the front property line. Mm -hmm. um, so um, contrary to what Ms. Aikenhead was suggesting, which is a smaller second floor addition that could be stepped back would make no difference to, to my clients. Um, one that I, I would entirely disagree. Okay. Um, and that might be just the type of compromise that might be possible. Okay, let me... Um... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so members of the board, would you like to see those additional images? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I, th I think it would be, it would be helpful. I mean, it, one of the big issues in this case is going to be the impact this has on the neighboring properties, which in part, in large part is going to have to do with visibility. And the one thing that we don't really have I mean, plot plans won't tell you that, and if understanding better than our memory of the walkthrough mm -hmm. that we did last spring um, would be a little helpful in having that in our minds. Can I, can I, can I just say one thing? I, I, I found the pictures I wanted to share with you. Okay, can if you, you could go ahead screen? and can, can share you see that. My screen, the red line. So currently we're seeing the image you had before, which is the driveway with the red arrow and the blue line. Oh, I don't want that. Okay. Chart A, visibility. Has not changed over. Uh... Okay, well, you I'm just, seeing it. But... You can stop it. Stop this share. Stop it, and then start a new one. Yeah. So unshare you, this. You screen. click on share screen. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. And then you should be able to pick something different. Okay. Um, but uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Cunningham. You had your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to note that although public comment period has closed, 
the chair has broad discretion and to the extent that there is something that the board would like to see and the chair would like would allow the board to see that uh, that would be permitted but just a reminder that the public comment period has closed thank you mr cunningham okay can you see my screen now can you can yep okay good so see this little red line yep this is the future height of the roof the highest the absolute highest point the historic district commission asked us to do this for them so we went up we measured up the roof height and we put a thing and when we marked it so here we are this is our future roof line this is sabrina and john's house and here's our future roof line and here is their house this is the highest point of the roof not the lowest point mm -hmm. this is if you're looking from way up at the corner you can see that you're going to slightly almost be able to see our top roof line and same here This is from the pond side. It's gonna go up here. That is good. That is helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I could go ahead and have you stop sharing. Um, and then Ms. Radigan, did you have the images that you referenced? I'm sorry, I don't, but I, I, John I have, and Sabrina. I, think, I have just two very short clips, I think. Maybe if they'd be helpful, I could share uh, my screen. Yeah, so Ms. Ralston, if you could give uh, John Garber the ability to share screen. Okay, you should have permission now to share. Okay, great. Um, um, th this, uh, I think, can, can everyone see a, like a video of a, a deck there? Yep. Okay. This is a view from our, um, actually from inside our house, uh, in, 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 from our, from our living room, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and you can sort of see the deck doors, deck doors are open. Yeah. And, um. This is another video. These are all very short. There's three. This is another uh, video of just um, from the, the property line, just showing the proximity. Can we put a stake? And that's the, the flag I there. We're the still see, I think we still see the same oh, sorry. image. Oh, sorry. Oh, boy. Um, give me one, one second. Sorry about that. No, no, take your time. Uh, uh, I think this is a view from the, sorry, I'll, I'll restart. Oh, there this we is go. a view from the property line. You can see a stake there. So there's nine feet. And then, um, I believe at the start of that video, you could see more around the corner where the parking is. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We could, right. uh, very, but it, it doesn't turn any more to the right. Doesn't. No. No, it doesn't. Okay. And then I, I think just to share, just one final one, equally short. Um, <clears throat> this is just from you know inside our. Uh, is this the right one, Serena? Okay. Yeah. This is from inside our living room. Uh, again, just showing kind of what, mm -hmm. what the current existing is and what we would be looking at to add ten feet on top of that. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, if, if when you look at that last picture, there's a chimney that's that's sort of coming up, and I imagine the ten feet is a bit higher than that chimney. I believe that, that chimney is the one that the pole with the red tag on it that Ms. Aiken had showed earlier. I think it's that chimney. Yeah. So you get you you get a sense if you look if you sort of imagine that that something a little higher, you get a sense of of uh what what you can't see what you can see now and you wouldn't be able to see if the if the addition went up even even that that level that 10 feet level yeah okay i mean 
it's not 10 feet above the top of the roof because the ceiling upstairs is nine feet. So it's 10 feet above the bottom of the roof. Yep. Okay. And my thanks to, uh, to Mr. Garber for sharing those images. Um, so going back to the board, so it sounds like there's still some questions that the board has um, at this stage that we need to try to resolve. And I'm, uh, per Mr. Hanlon's uh, comments earlier, I'm not sure we have all the information in a format that we would need not only to to render a determination, but also to then be able to verify that the terms of whatever decision is made are being followed um, as the as if, if the project were approved and to move forward. So um, I, from what I've heard from the board at this time, um, that the, the site plan really needs to be inclusive. It needs to show where the proposed parking is really going to be. Um, it should include the uh, front entrance, which is now going to be re relocated to the left side, but that with the, the entry stairs for that um, and confirmation on the, <clears throat> just on the location of the, the retaining walls, just to make sure we have that understood. Um, and were there other, was there other information that the board was was seeking. Um, I mean, it would be helpful, I think, to understand the turning radiuses for the vehicles, but I'm not entirely sure that that's, that's some, sort of something we have not requested in the past for a residential project of this scale. Um, we've certainly done so for you know comprehensive permits, but not for something of this small a scale. But I don't know if that's something that the board would find helpful for its deliberations. Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I, I think something that at least gives us the information, I'm not sure how formal it would have to be. I think that, you know, if we have a clear delineation of where the parking is, then I think that you can get a feel yourself. I mean, if other members feel they want something that's more scientific, that's fine. But I, I'd like to go back to it's a part of this that's critical for me is, you know, if I'm looking at the view from the Garber's deck, which I believe is what the clips were that we were just viewing, although from inside the house, um, even though there's no such thing as a, a view easement in, in our bylaw. So I think, though, it would be important from my understanding to see essentially what that view would look like um, if you were on the Garber's deck or at least from the front so that we could get a sense as to where the roof is going to be extended if you're viewing it from the house. Because as Mr. Hanlon said, you can see what you can see and can't see from the Garber's deck where it currently, as it's currently constructed. But Ms. Aiken had said, and I want to make sure I understand this, that the 10 feet is not from the top of the roof, it's from the bottom, or is that from the bottom of the shingles, the bottom of the roof as you're looking at it from the front, it would go up 10 feet from that point? Is that what we're saying? Yes, approximately, because the first floor height is established already, and then there's a hip roof that goes up, but the second yeah. floor is gonna sit on top of the first floor and it has a flat roof, so, I believe the ceilings are nine feet and you need some framing. So it's probably 10 feet. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so this is the current top of the first floor. This door is in the same place. Yeah, I see. And so this, this is, is the top. This. Yeah, but, so this is essentially- well, the hip the roof theme. probably goes to here right now, roughly. Could the somebody, I don't know who has control there, but could somebody oh, show me where- <laughs> So the, the pitched roof probably comes to about this. Yes, I agree. But where's the top of the existing roof right now? So that would be the top of the existing roof would be about here. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. the new part, the new part that's built in the front is going to be a couple of feet higher. Correct. And then in the back, is it is it true that then the total height, if you're looking at 
the front as it exists now is going to be that 10 feet higher? Is that what that sort of- The back, the back part, see, yeah, there you go. The back part, which is now on the right-hand side, yeah. is the highest part, that's the 26 feet height versus the allowable 35. The front is a little bit stepped down. I will say that we have met with the Garbers once with their attorney and twice otherwise to say, what can we do to make this better? Can we take a foot off the roof? Can we make some adjustments? And their answer across the board has been, do nothing. We will support nothing. You can build out your basement. So if they want to propose something, we are so happy to listen. Uh, Chairman Klein, could you just, yes. on that picture that you have, would you go back and show me where in the front, the, you had just showed me where the roof line was existing yeah. um, on the front of the... Yeah, so, it's about uh, this. so if we're going yeah. to the side view, then that would be approximately in this position. Got it. Okay. So, so the distance above that is not 10 feet. No, it's more 10 feet above this line here for the second floor. Right. But I'm trying to figure visually from say the Garber's property, it's going to be not a full 10 feet above what exists now. No, not above what exists now. All right, Mr. that's- Mr. That's Mr. Chair. So, sorry to interrupt, but there's an elevation. Like. There's an elevation later on in this set that shows the existing oh. uh, ridge height of the roof from the first floor level. So you can get a sense of that. And I believe it's about eight feet difference. Okay. To the new high which... point of the roof to the existing. Do you remember which sheet number that was? Uh, it should be page 20 on the PDF. Okay. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So they have that 12 foot three and a half from the first floor to the top of the ridge. So if you, you do the math for the at the high point of the roof is uh of the proposed is 20 foot 11 and three quarters from the first floor height so difference of home you know eight eight feet and change but you have to double check and make sure this is from average grade because that 26 is from average grade and that looks like yeah it's it's uh 20, 20 foot and 11 and three quarters from first floor which is the same dimension that that 12 foot 11 and three quarters, whatever is measured from. Well, that said first floor, but the 26 is from average grade, which is lower. Yeah, I'm just, I'm talking about the 20 foot, 11 and three quarters is measured from first floor. Right, right. But but the 26 is from average grade. So it's not an eight, necessarily an eight foot differential. There is another diagram in here somewhere that tells yeah, you. But it, it's, it's visually, it's a eight foot differential of what the existing roof height is to the proposed. So it's just trying to answer Mr. DuPont's kind of thing of how much higher is this new roof than the, the uh, existing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other, other questions or comments from the board? All right, so seeing none, um, Mr. Chairman, could I yes, one, just one of the things that I'm sure Ms. Aikenhead is noticing is that I mean we have been focusing on the impact uh, on this this little neighborhood, which does raise some special considerations, and I at least I think we're all trying to be sensitive to what the impact uh, uh, is. Uh, this house is probably, I think, now the smallest of the houses of the group. Uh, it is not going to turn into a McMansion. Uh, it's not what the design guidelines were concerned about. Those are the five and 6,000 square feet houses that are cropping up in, in other parts of, uh, on, on other parts of town. But still, this is, a, this is the environment it is, which is all tight together and where a little bit of activity on one house affects the others. I just want to emphasize that what we have not talked about is all the things that was talked about before the Conservation Commission. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of things that are in the public interest that are being done 
in connection with this this development in terms of the effect on spy pond in terms of the effect on erosion and and wildlife and and all of the kinds of things that the conservation commission is concerned with um this is like to make to make a big improvement and that improvement won't be just enjoyed by uh, this property but everybody else who's enjoying this little bit of, this bit of the lake and i think we shouldn't forget that and which and in some ways that's what is making this case seem so difficult for me because there is a lot of good in it and it isn't just a nuisance to everybody and it isn't just it isn't like building a big mansion someplace where you'd rather not have it uh this is a situation in which uh, uh there's a lot on the good side and in which nevertheless there is an impact i think on the surrounding neighborhood that we have to decide something about how reasonable that is and i must say i'm very disappointed that and i don't i do not want to listen to any other discussion about who it is who is willing to talk to whom when uh, the fact is that nobody seems to have been willing to talk at it the same time so there was never a conversation um, I think that just in order to be able to put this in order so we have something that is structured that we can properly vote on it is going to take a little bit of time. Um, but I can certainly say that if both sides should decide that now is the time to talk and to talk seriously about making accommodations that could soften this degree of um, the, 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 that could soften the impact that the house is certainly going to have on on the neighborhood uh, that it would certainly make our job a lot easier when we try to figure out uh, what to do with it. The, the way this is going, there's going to be winners and losers. And I don't really want anyone to be a winner and loser if necessarily if if it's possible to come up with something that if it's not perfect is still something that uh, that is an appropriate compromise on both sides. So there's a little bit of an opening left for serious conversation. Uh, I don't want to actually, if, if it doesn't happen, we're going to do our job and we're going to do the balance that we can. And I don't think anybody can, can, can predict what we'll do, but I certainly can't, and I can't predict what I will do. So, um, there, there, so there's some room for trying to do a little private ordering rather than take your chances with, uh, well-meaning but not perfect members of a public body like this one. Well, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so if we could focus on what additional information the board would like to have before it renders this decision, um, we can pass that along to the applicants. The applicant is aware. Um, and then, you know, per your 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 very well taken um, statement. There is still, you know, a small opening to to see if there's a way to come to some kind of an agreement that's a little bit more in keeping with everybody. I understand. Uh, we've certainly heard that, um, you know, there have been there has been an effort to try to get some compromise, um, but it has not proceeded very well. Um, and hopefully, there's there is an opportunity and a way to make that work um, because otherwise the, as, as Mr. Hanlon said, the board is just going to have to, to render a decision. Um, I think we've talked about the site plan and what we would like to see better delineated on the site plan. We want it to be more, you know, everything that's going to be on that site, we want to see it so we know exactly where it's going. Um, if there are any changes to uh, the plans. So right now the, like these elevations are out of sync with the, my understanding is at least these are out of sync now with where the, um, where the retaining wall is in terms of where the patio height is and things like that. So we just want to make sure that that's all taken care of and cleaned up. Um, so that, so that the, the drawings we're looking at are, you know, accurate, that they're coordinated and accurate. Um, I think it would also be helpful, um, if we did have a plan, you know, if we'd had like on the, the the proposed north elevation, if it was dashed in sort of where the the outline of the existing house, if we could do have a set of plans of that, um, it should be very simple for the architect to do, but it would give us a good, you know, a good visual of how to compare what we're seeing um, 
before and after. So we're so that's a little bit clearer delineate clear more clearly delineated for us. Um, are there other things that the board would want to request? Mr. Chair, Mr. Riccadelli, just to to build off what you said, you know, I'm I'm most concerned about um, just seeing a, a coordinated site plan with all the elements on it, just so we know, uh, you know, both the locations of of the retaining walls that we talked about, but also the extents of those walls. Um, and uh, I know Ms. Aiken, had you mentioned that things with grading get difficult, but um, this is a projection for you because this is the plan that we can approve, um, but it's also um, uh, a check for the neighbors so that they know exactly what they're getting if uh, if this were to be approved. So I think that's critical and especially um, the parking area and the dimensions of that parking area so we can evaluate you know, the best we can um, whether that can accommodate the cars that it's supposed to. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, a few minutes ago, there was a discussion that was talking about turning radiuses and so forth, and I, I'm not sure that that came to a conclusion. Uh, again, I'm not, uh, as is true of others, I'm not particularly wedded to any particular way of doing that. But having some visual way for us to make an independent judgment of, of the very different views the applicant and some of the neighbors have on how functional the proposed parking will will be and uh whether or not you can actually uh use what you have there without backing up and then going into a, a neighbor's driveway um it would be useful just to be able to to, to see that so that we can make up our uh, uh our, our minds because the applicant and the neighbors have a totally different view of the reality on that and uh we're going to have to choose what what we think is right. And I don't at this point want to make that um, based on credibility. Uh, I'd like to to have at least some evidence that enables us to to form an independent judgment. Mr. Shark? Yes, Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, just to go off Mr. Hanlon's point, I think um, when we're talking about the parking, if we could at least get, you know, a couple of outlines of what a car looks like in the proposed parking area, I think that'll go a long way in helping us understand the maneuverability of a vehicle in the space. Um, nothing fancy, you know, just a dashed outline of a typical vehicle size, um, I think would be helpful and go a long way. Thank you. Hmm. Anything further from the board? Okay. Um, then I am going to recommend that we continue this hearing. Um, hmm. So we have a couple of dates coming up. Uh, so November 14th is effectively three weeks from now. Um, and then we would also have the November 28th is two weeks after that. That is just after Thanksgiving. So it's not Thanksgiving week. Um, and then we have December 12th. So those are the next three upcoming dates for the board. Um, as I would ask Ms. Aikenhead if she feels she could be ready for the 14th or would she prefer the 28th? I might possibly be able to be ready with the 14th, but there's a lot to pull together. So the 28th is probably safer. Okay. Okay. Appreciate that. So, um, with that, then I would uh, entertain a motion to continue the special permit hearing for 212 Pleasant Street uh, to a date certain of Tuesday, November 28th at 7.30 p.m. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a motion to continue the special permit hearing for 212 Pleasant Street on, to a date certain of October 28th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. as moved by Mr. Hanlon, seconded by Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. 
the chair votes aye, we are continued on 212 Pleasant Street. Um, thank you all very much. Mr. And Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I, I just like the record to reflect that this board member at least would be particularly happy uh, and thank and give a lot of thanks uh, in the days after Thanksgiving if what we have next time is a kumbaya moment rather than a three hour hearing. Thank you. We'll try. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Okay, so this brings us back to our agenda. The next item is docket 3770-4042, Dorothy Road. Um, so I would ask the applicant to introduce himself and uh, tell us why they are before the board. Yes, hello everyone. I am Erica Schwartz. I'm the executive director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, and I am joined by Vikas N.T., um, from Reframe Systems, a Somerville-based company. Uh, so we are um, proposing to put an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, behind HCA's existing two-family home, which is located at 40 to 42 Dorothy Road. Um, and I will just quickly run through some, uh, just a few views just to like orient you. Um, and then Vikas can kind of get into the details of the benefits of this um of what, oh, the benefits that we see for what we're proposing so if, if, you, ask if, you, well if you could go ahead and give the schwartz the co-host privilege yeah, not yet. all right you should be all set now okay um so just a very few couple slides so um no oh, my first one was actually a pretty sort of start with our all right so you're seeing a map right now yep. right yeah, just, just to orient people, this is 40 to 42 Dorothy Road. It's at the corner with Parker Street, which at least the corner of is a private way. Um, and you can see it It sort of backs up to, to Thorndike Field, um, an area that I believe, regardless of, I, I haven't actually tracked what's happening with the the proposal proposed for parts of that, but I think where we back up uh, is an area that will remain woodsy regardless. Um, so this is just a view on Dorothy Road of our two family when you're standing on Dorothy Road facing it straight on. And then it's at the corner with Parker. And so this is this is the view from that private way. And you can see this um, garage in the back, which we would plan to demolish. Um, our tenants, our current tenants uh, do not use it. Um, and approximately in its, in its place, but it, a different shape, sort of narrower, longer, a little taller, we'd be proposing to put the ADU. And this is just another view of the garage straight on. And you can see that we really, you know, the property line goes right up to that wooded area. Um, so I'll just say just a few words about why we're excited before turning it over. So um, normally HCA wouldn't be pursuing a single unit of affordable housing. Um, but we're excited to do this because we are partnering with Reframe Systems and they have sort of a new product that they're they're putting into this pilot phase. We're actually getting to do this at a lower cost than might be in the future because um, they're piloting it with us, as well as some other communities. They also have a similar agreement um, with the Somerville Community Corporation where they're going to pilot a triple decker. But what they're proposing is a product that's a modular unit, but it's it's sort of like the newest, greatest modular units of today, um, where it is a net zero, all electric, um, solar powered, Massachusetts built in their own factory, a modular unit meant to be a cheaper alternative to traditional construction. So we're really excited to place this single unit and create one more unit of affordable housing, but also we're just interested in seeing if this might be something we might want to use in the future for a multifamily development. Um, so I and and I will just say one other thing, which is um, we've we've spoken about this with our own tenants in both of the units in our development, um, and also with and I think he's here, um, our abutter sort of across that private way, who's the only other a property owner that sort of you would regularly use that this this part of the private way um, opposite our garage is another garage um, to make sure that he's aware of what our plans are and and you know we'd be coordinating on you know the brief days when there would be a crane for example maybe bringing this these pieces of this modular unit to make sure there was 
um, we weren't disrupting any access to the driveway that's opposite ours. Um, so I'll stop uh, sharing um, and turn it over to Vikas. Thanks, Erica. Hello, everyone. My name is Vikas. I'm uh, the co-founder CEO of Reframe Systems. Uh, we're partnering with Erica and HCA to build this uh, two-story ADU. Uh, I, would I would like to request screen sharing permissions. I could walk you through. There we go. Um, what we're actually requesting. So um, as Erica pointed out, um, oh, wrong window, sorry. Um, as Erica pointed out, we're replacing an existing garage uh, with the two-story ADU. This is still a high-level schematic. We're still refining a lot of the details at, but in the interest of time, we wanted to get uh, a couple of uh, variances in play. Um, so we've submitted a special permit uh, request. Uh, the first thing is to get site setback variance uh, to, to place this unit will be within six feet of the property line in the back. Uh, to, to make sure that we can meet the appropriate size of the unit and also uh, create uh, off-street parking for the, the primary, the principal dwelling. Uh, we end up in a situation where we'll end up placing the ADU on the property line at the back and we'll be within four feet uh, to the left side. Um, so that's the first variance we're requesting from, uh, from the zoning board. The second thing we're requesting is a height variance. Um, the, uh, by right require uh, allows us to get up to 20 feet tall. Um, we'll actually end up being in our current version of the design almost uh, 23 feet. This is largely driven by by two things. One, we're in an effort to make sure we're not disrupting topsoil and not increasing the use of concrete. Uh, we're choosing to go with helical piles as our foundation system. Uh, this ends up adding uh, almost a foot in height. And uh, because we're using uh, prefabricated volumetric modules, um, we end up with some inefficiencies with height, which are not an issue for other zoning considerations. We're kind of hitting up against a, a constraint here. Uh, the, a huge advantage of taking the volumetric approach where we ship, where we prefabricate this entire structure in the factory and bring it over is that the actual construction site is not really a construction site. It's a pretty quick, installed process, a very little disruption to neighbors. It's a really clean, quiet site. And also allows us to really be very quick. Uh, but to, to to make this happen, uh, we will need to uh, request a height variance. Um, and then the uh, the inspector flagged to, uh, that we had to request for two additional variances as part of it. Uh, one was uh, to create the driveway because this is a corner lot, even though we're gonna have the driveway um, created on the, the location of the existing garage. It was suggested that we request a variance uh, to do that. So we're, we're adding it here for documentation purposes. And um, lastly, uh, we're still refining our, our floor plan, but we'd like to understand if there's an appetite to allow us to build uh, an additional 108 square feet. Uh, that's where our current gross floor area is landing. A big chunk of this is uh, due to the insulation requirements. Uh, we're trying to build to a passive house zero rating which requires us to have about four inches of exterior continuous insulation. Um, that adds about 67 square feet. And since there is no allowance to not treat exterior insulation uh, separately from, from uh, gross floor area, we're kind of impacted there. The second piece is because we're building this as an affordable rental unit, we're trying to comply with uh, DHCD's requirements for minimum sizes for bedrooms. Uh, that's adding some additional 27 square feet for our um, bedroom on the second floor. And lastly, again, to meet passive house ratings, our mechanical room has to be increased in size to have an energy recovery ventilator that's adding another 14 square feet. So this stack up is what's driving the delta from the 900 square feet cap to the 1,008 square feet. We believe these are all small changes given the unique location of the site, the fact that it's really not going to intrude that much on neighbors and is just kind of tucked away in the back. We believe all of these variances are, are, are minor and don't really affect the character of the neighborhood. We would like to request your your support in allowing us to realize 
uh, building an affordable uh, passive house zero ADU and having the serve as a blueprint for how we can partner with other community corporations to get more affordable housing out there. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so what we have before us in this application, so it's it's a special permit for the accessory dwelling unit in an accessory structure. And then there are three additional variances because there's two that were published, um, but we are looking, so one would be for front yard parking, so we had the height variance and the site setback as part of special permit uh, 23-1. And then the inspection um, yeah. department flagged that we create uh, V23-1 to, to flag the, the floor area uh, variance and the parking variance. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I, I had noted the 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 height in the area um before but as you say they are in a way sort of baked into the way that you you do your construction and then the way you um you design these units um is there any and you had you know specifically indicated you know, how much of that area is really taken up by issues like insulation and minimum room sizes and and the like um, so when the accessory dwelling unit was, uh, bylaw was passed by a town meeting a few years ago, um, it was a pretty contentious item on, in a lot of ways. Um, and the, you know, the, the 900 square feet was, was established to sort of keep the, keep ADUs from becoming, uh, too large and too prominent, um, as they went forward and to really sort of keep them as a, as a, as a minor uh, use on the site rather than a primary use. Um, so I think that you know, this is something that the board is gonna have to, to talk about, but my, my greater sort of underlying concern um, is where this is a request for variance. Um, the first variance criteria is looking for something that is unique about the site that basically would make it impossible to adhere to the requirements of the zoning bylaw. And what we have here is a flat rectangular site, um, which doesn't really have anything about it that would preclude following the bylaws um, with the exception of the, the chosen method of construction. Um, and so I think this is sort of the first thing that the board is going to have to really consider is, you know, can the, is, is this something that the board can consider for a variance or does this not meet the requirements for a variance, um, under state law? So I would open that question to the board. Um, so what their opinion is on that, on that question. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So uh, first I wanna say, I think it's a great looking concept and I'm very supportive of the idea in general um, of this type of construction. And I will admit though, that what Mr. Klein has just outlined was also on my mind. So one question I have is, is this going to be set uh, right on the lot line in the rear? That's what the drawing currently shows. I think we, we have some opportunity for moving it by right up to a foot. Uh, but yeah, because I, I have I had a question about that, and it's partly because I'm not entirely clear. I mean, I do think that, as Mr. Klein put it, it's really due to the nature of the materials and the construction that the you know that the dimensional requirements as far as the square footage and the height are being proposed to exceed what's currently allowed um and and generally speaking when we look at a variance we say well it has to be some part of the land that is unique to this property but having to do with 
um, topography, soil condition, or lot shape. And I, I'm not sure, and I'm not saying I can't be persuaded, but I'm not sure I see that. And that also, it raised a question for me about, you know, we've had a lot of garages in the town that are sitting on the property line in the rear. So that's not anything that's unusual. But what is a little bit different here is that there's a proposal essentially to demolish the garage and to reconstruct a larger building. And I was trying to go through the zoning bylaw to see if there's anything in there that says that you can build something um, essentially from scratch, uh, you know, that would be on the lot line. And there certainly are provisions to build a garage on the rear lot line. That's, you know, that's in there. And I, I just don't see, you know, unless the building department inspectional services is saying, well, you know, we consider it to be a demolition. You know, a lot of times when there's demolition of an existing building, they require, and I, I don't know under which specific provision of the state building code that you leave up like 50% of what's existing in order to have it not be an entire demolition, but to be an addition. And, you know, the architects on the board can speak to that much better than I can, but I'm I'm not entirely clear how we get around the fact that we're taking down a building and we're putting up a new building, which is clearly not a garage, and we're calling it an ADU, which to some extent shouldn't make a difference because we've looked at garages on the rear lot line, knowing that those are going to be converted completely to living space. And we haven't had a problem with that concept but I still don't necessarily see how we get from demolishing an entire garage and not using it as part of the ADU and then putting in a brand new building, which is not a garage, and then having it be an ADU. And maybe other members of the board can help me out here because I'm stuck on that point before I even get to the square footage and the uh, height. And then, of course, the parking. So there's a lot sort of wrapped up here, even though generally I like the concept. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> two things. Uh, I am like Mr. Like the chair, I think, and like uh, Mr. DuPont hung up on the notion of, uh, of, of the um, figuring out how this relates to soil typography or the shape of the lot. And that's not something that we can just wave and say, well, if it's a good idea, we have actually had within the last six months, several cases, which where what the applicant proposed to do was a really good idea, but because it violated, you, because it couldn't be justified uh, on that basis, we had to say no, because that's what variance law requires us to do. Um, <clears throat> I do have a difference of view with respect to uh, whether you can tear down the dry garage. Obviously, you can convert a garage and you could probably add things to the garage so that you have an addition to. And that's all something that wouldn't po pose any particular conceptual difficulty. Um, but uh, if the problem is demolishing the garage, then you have to sort of think, well, where... What, how does that stand? And I'd like to point out and look at the provision of the bylaw because where with the six foot limit comes from is the accessory dwelling units. Um, and what the bylaw says is an accessory dwelling unit may be located in an accessory building, which accessory building shall not constitute a principal or main building by the incorporation of the accessory dwelling unit Provided that if such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line, then such accessory dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Board of Appeals uh, grants a special permit on finding that the creation of such accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood uh, than the use of the accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. And it seemed to me that... Uh, the authority to do some to to 
build something new is implicit in the language that is chosen by the accessory dwelling unit ordinance itself. Um, it doesn't talk about garages, uh, particularly, uh, although it clearly is thinking of garages as one possible excel use that uh, would be a benchmark for considering what the accessory dwelling unit would be. But all the way through this, it talks about accessory buildings, and, and, and it talks about them in, in a general way that doesn't limit it uh, to a garage or any other particular kind of accessory building. Uh, I'm absolutely positive, as somebody who was who worked with the folks who at town meeting who brought this about, that they would be astonished at the notion that you had that this only applied to garage conversions and didn't apply to other kinds of accessory uh, buildings that were that were built new. Um, and clearly, you can build, you can have accessory dwelling units in new buildings. Uh, if it weren't, as a matter of fact, if it weren't within six feet of the lot line, then you wouldn't actually have to come to us at all. It would be buildable by right. If it is within six feet, then you can still do all the same things you could do. If it wasn't, there isn't suddenly a a, a, a requirement that this be a pre-existing garage that suddenly jumps up when you make it five and a half feet. Uh, you are basically still doing the same things you were before, but this time you have an additional criterion that comes into play. Uh, <clears throat> I've made this point on, on a couple of other occasions that where it wasn't as pushed to the extent that it is here. Um, but actually, I think that while the, the framers were certainly looking at all those garages that were on the property line, they chose to write and town meeting chose to accept a uh, much more generally written uh, bylaw that uh, did not did not imagine that if you were within six feet of the lot line, you had to have a prior uh, a prior garage. So I'm not too concerned about that. I am I am concerned, however, about uh, in general meeting the the requirements of the state law. And I will also say that I'm very concerned about violating the 900 square foot limit. Again, as somebody who is part of the process that brought us this this uh, bylaw, that was very important in allaying the concerns of people who thought that the ADU bylaw would be an indirect way of allowing you to essentially turn a single family into a two family house. You wanted to have some way of limiting that down. And I understand here that that when you figure out why it is you need the extra space uh, to accommodate in this particular kind of construction situation to accommodate uh, Passive House Zero, um, it still is a really important part of the compromise that brought us the legislation that the limit was 900 square feet. And I'm finding it very difficult to uh, to reconcile that underlying idea with the notion that 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 is variable by variance. It, it that gives me a lot of pause. Thank you. Really to, oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Henty. Sorry, I was going to say uh, that was really helpful to hear. I think to us, the place where we have the greatest flexibility is working hard to reduce the, the, the floor area. The, the site setback is something we obviously um, don't have much of a choice given the site constraints. And, and that's probably the one we'd like to focus uh, the, the board's attention to. And then the second thing would be um, if there's any appetite for considering the height increase. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would try to manage the, the floor area to be within 900 square feet. Mr. Chair? Mr. LeBlanc. Um, I think at first when I saw this, I was a little unsure about, you know, the demoing of a garage and then putting up a new structure, kind of how Mr. DuPont laid out. But I think the more I've kind of looked at this, maybe I could be persuaded that it is something that's possible. But I think where I get hung up is the the extra height and the extra square footage. Because when I when I look at this, um, you know, it's a two bedroom unit, you know, a, a two bedroom, two bath unit, which I think is a pretty good unit. Um, but I think it could be done as a one bedroom or a studio and be within that hundred uh, with the within that nine hundred square feet and still be a successful thing. And that would get rid of both of those items as well, because you would get rid of the 
um, the height increase. It would be, you know, something comparable to the height of the existing garage that's there. And then also still be, you know, I'm assuming, uh, haven't done the math, but I'm assuming it would be well under the, the 900 square feet if we just do a single, single story thing. And I um, also just going back to the other ADUs that we've seen uh, so far come across the board have either been one bedrooms or studios that we've looked at that are going into existing garages. So we, we I think because it's the square footage thing that gets you, um, it kind of restricts you to those levels. Um, and obviously, as we can see, once you start to try and push the boundaries on that and get two bedrooms, you're really above that. Um, so I think it'd be something that I'd be willing to consider if we saw it as a, you know, something that is conforming more to the height and floor area. Thank you for that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Uh, to be brief, so I'm persuaded by what Mr. Hanlon read uh, from the accessory dwelling unit section. I do, however, wish that they had made some sort of a reference back to the fact that, you know, notwithstanding the provisions of the dimensional and density uh, requirements, you know, where it says you've got a six foot rear yard, uh, you know, setback or side yard, I so, suppose as well. I, I kind of wish they'd tied that up so that if you read it, you knew exactly that th this that's in the chart doesn't apply to the accessory dwelling unit. So that's just an aside, but yeah, I think that it was well stated and I'm, I'm persuaded that it is, uh, it is doable um, to put it on the property line. And I think Mr. LeBlanc's points are also very well taken and I'm sort of in alignment with those. Okay, thank you. Um, in regards to the, the question about the parking, so is Parker Street private or public? You believe it's, the section is private? Sorry, Erica, I think you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, it's my understanding it's a private way. Okay. Um, Right, because if it's a private way, then you can accommodate parking on the street, and it's outside of our jurisdiction. Right. Um, but the parking that is on the property would have to follow the the bylaw, um, and so the spaces have to be seven and a half by eighteen or eight and a half by eighteen, and not in the front yard, uh, which is it's a front yard that faces Parker. So would it be possible to just extend the driveway farther back so that that what what here is rendered as the blue car could effectively be parked farther from the street? Uh, we believe so. Um, we just have to verify that, but we believe we can uh, create a, a setback from the street uh, to where the, the parking officially starts. So we feel confident we can address that. Okay. Uh, the the zoning board is uh, amenable to us having that driveway. And then, could I just ask a question? So, that please, what is the amount of space that's required to be called front yard that we wouldn't be parking on? Is there a dimension there that it would have to not encroach upon? Or? So it is. So, unfortunately, I can't read the numbers on the the drawing that's on the screen. Um, but basically, whatever. So the setback where the building comes closest to that side street, that there's a setback, is it say 12 feet maybe? I think, yeah, yeah. The existing building. It, yeah. The existing building? Okay. So as long as that 12 feet um, is maintained. And actually that raises, uh, raises another interesting question, which is that the accessory dwelling unit is also located partly in the front yard. You no, know, it's all in the, uh, is it in the front yard or the side yard? <laughs> this was confusing to me just because the the address of Dorothy Street, right? Yeah, yeah. Faces Dorothy, that's the front of the two family, but we're creating an accessory dwelling unit that will essentially face Parker Street. So I. I got a little caught up in what's considered a front yard or not, but. Yeah, so 
it's a corner lot. So it has two front yards that face the two rights of way. So one, one faces Parker, one faces Dorothy. Um, and then it has one side yard and one rear yard, but you get to choose. So the choice, I believe that was made here, is that the side yard is the one that goes along Dorothy and the rear yard is the one that faces the 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 um the end of Parker Street there. Um so it's a little confusing in the zoning bylaw as to whether that portion of the lot, that corner uh Parker, if that is still within the rear yard or if that is front yard. Um, the front yard yard extending the full width of the lot between the front line of the nearest building wall and the front lot line. And the rear yard is a yard unoccupied except by accessory structure or accessory use is herein permitted, extending the full width of the lot. Well, that's not helpful. Um, they both say they stretch the full width of the lot, but in this corner condition, where does one end and the other begin? Because my, my concern is, again, is that table that gives the setback dimensions for accessory structures in the residential districts. It's six feet from the rear and six feet from the side lot line, but it's 20 feet from the front, which in this case would be 12 because it's established elsewhere on the lot. But that would severely curtail the ability to locate the building in this position, which we're trying desperately not to curtail. Um, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. LeBlanc. There is a illustration in mm -hmm. section two that I don't know if that's when you're looking at that um, designates, you know, front lot lines and rear and side lot lines for corner lots. Um, the there's a notation on that says one of each and determine that owner's discretion. Right. Right, but the, what I'm getting hung up on is the definition for front lot line says it's the full width okay. of the lot. And the rear lot line also says it's the full width. But obviously, they can't both be the full width because they overlap. Yeah. So <laughs> which prevails? Um. Um, but I think certainly what we would like to try to do is get this so that there are no variance requests. Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> so the, I, I assume that the <clears throat> definitions are struck in this way because Unless you have a corner lot, the front the front yard never intersects with the with the rear yard, and so right. the problem of overlap never never comes up. And the draftsman just didn't, or the drafters, I guess, should say, didn't have this situation in mind when when they drew the definitions. Um, and I guess I. I don't. It, it, we, there's no way that we, we can just make something up, but we because somehow this has to get resolved one way or the other. Um, but maybe somebody's already made something up, and I wonder if we could have a conversation with or get the idea of inspectional services as to what to do in this situation, or more less usefully possibly is what, the, what this board may have done in the past. But I'm guessing that that would be extremely hard to find. Uh, we might be able to find our our, our way uh, our way through th through this, um, assuming that uh, assuming that that it turns out that that way of approaching it is useful for the applicant because it still it still does a fair amount of <laughs> eliminating their flexibility on how to on how to proceed here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, we just have to, in the absence of guidance from inspectional services, it seems to me we just have to decide wh how to reconcile these irreconcilable things in this kind of, in this situation. Oh, absolutely. Um, are there other questions from the board at this moment? Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Riccadelli. Uh, if I can just ask a question of the applicant, um, just because this has come up in, in past projects, but uh, especially if we have lot line conditions, um, you know, if if this were a garage, we'd be requiring type one or type two construction for that wall, uh, but also limiting the amount of openings in the wall that's on the zero lot line condition. And, uh, you know, there's our, our zoning, Arlington zoning, but also the, the building code under under three feet will actually, you know, not not allow openings in that zero lot line condition wall. So I'm just wondering um, for the applicants, you know, would that be a, a possibility with your plans to um, first construct it in a non-combustible way uh, at the zero lot line condition and also to reconfigure to um, not have openings along that side? The, getting to a type one or type two construction with our uh, current construction method is going to be pretty hard for us to do. The The second thing is we were given our understanding that the, the wooded area in the back may not be developed in for the foreseeable future. We were actually hoping to lean into that fact and actually move all of our windows to that side and actually have that be more of the pub. So uh, very counter to uh, <laughs> what you're suggesting, unfortunately. Yeah, I, no, I understand. I, I, you know, I, I think that this uh, has such great merit. And uh, like the other board members, I think we would really love to see a lot of these in Arlington. So uh, ho hopeful that there's a way we can get there. I just, I, I so I think that that, uh, like I said, you know, may not be a building or a zoning code issue that may be a building code issue. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, well, this board would not have the authority to get around that, um, those requirements in terms of openings. Uh, so just something to consider as as you, you all move forward. Yeah. We, yeah, and if I could just add, we will have to consider that obviously if it's a building code issue, but part of it was also that for the uh, the privacy, this is relatively close to the, the main structure. And so for our existing tenants, they indicated understandably like, well, how close is it gonna be? Can we still have some privacy? So we thought, well, if we have more windows on the wooded side, it's nicer for the people in the new ADU and it's nicer for the existing tenants. But so we'll we'll see if we can work that out. Mr. Chair. Mr. Holly. The exception 5428 for exemption for energy efficient homes mm -hmm. does have an existing principal building by definition here. The minimum frontage and the lot area exemptions are made for a Hearst score of 50, 44 or better. Would, but we're not doing in the existing foundation footprint, so or by a special permit. It's an and requirement there, right? It's both. Or it's, it's it's sorry, it's an or requirement. You know, it's not. You know, yeah. Would that apply in this situation? Potentially. But um, sorry, was that Mr. Ho Mr. Uh, Hanlon? Mr. Hanlon, what that gets you is uh, what that gets you is the inadequate frontage and inadequate lot size would be forgiven under those circumstances, which would make some lots buildable that otherwise are not buildable. But I don't see how that would here. That's not a problem to begin with. You're doing an accessory building on an existing lot. And um, regardless of the lot size and, and frontage, you're able to do that under the ADU bylaw. Okay. Um, at this stage, I do want to uh, if I could ask the, the applicant to stop the screen sharing, and then I would like to open for public comment. Um, I don't know if there are members of the public who are here to, a, to talk to this, but I would like to give them an opportunity if there are. Um, so 
in a moment, I will open the hearing for public comment. Public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand. and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Um, if you wish to speak, you can digitally raise your hand using the button on the reactions tab and the Zoom application. If you're on phone, you can dial star nine. Uh, you'll be called upon by the chair uh, as to give your name and address the record and given time for your questions and comments. Uh, so with that, um, we have one speaker, uh, Rebecca Gruber. Uh, Rebecca Gruber, 215 Pleasant Street. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm very excited about the HCA's proposal for this ADA unit and um, the type of construction being proposed. I remember that when town meeting voted on the ADU bylaws, this was one of the hopes they had for the use of ADUs. And I'm very supportive of the ZBA finding a way to make this work and um, having this opportunity for adding an affordable unit in our town. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I um, I find myself in the unenviable position of, I believe, disagreeing somewhat with Mr. Hanlon um, in terms of his interpretation of the ADU bylaw. I think it it hinges on the definition of the word creation. Um, my memory of the discussions that occurred around this in town meeting was that the idea was to have ADUs occur as part of existing structures or renovation of existing structures, be them within the primary residence or uh, a conversion of a garage like we discussed, like, like the folks have been discussing earlier, not the demolition of a garage and a rebuild of a new structure. Um, and because I think that's a stretch of the ADU bylaw because you're taking an accessory drilling unit in that case and not putting it to a different use. You're removing it and building another accessory structure, which I think is a different concept. And I, I, I think it's, I think it's important because uh, the, I thought the point of the ADU bylaw was to take what is somewhat accessory structures that are used for one use and adapting either to that use plus another or adapting it entirely to the other use in the terms of a garage, for instance, but not tearing it down and building a new structure. Um, so I'm a little, little confused about why this is okay here. Um, and maybe Mr. Hanlon can uh, enlighten me as to why I am wrong. Mr. Hanlon? Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Chairman, the, let's take a simpler situation. Let's suppose that you have a relatively small house and you have enough room to, and you don't have a garage, and you have enough room to build a new structure, a new accessory structure, um, that is not within six feet of the lot line. Uh, in that situation, there is not a single word in the bylaw that prevents you from doing that. And not only that is it doesn't come to us, it goes directly to Mr. Champa, who would approve it as a matter of right. There is not a word that says you have to be repurposing an existing building. The language is always just an accessory building. And this, and this would be an accessory building. All right, so suppose you take the next step. Suppose you say, well, that's all true, but suppose you already have a garage there, but it's an old, ugly garage and you don't want to use it. Well, you say, okay, I'll take away that garage. I'll demolish it. It's empty. Now it's empty like it was in the first example. I'm going to build a building there and it's a new accessory building and it's not within six feet of the lot line. Again, Mr. Champa has, would decide this all by himself and he wouldn't have a single word in the bylaw to rely on to say you couldn't do that. So what is the difference between that and this and what happens if you build it within six feet? The only difference is that it comes to us. The only difference is the jurisdiction. And what we have to do, what we have to do there is apply a very limited standard of review 
in order to in order to approve it. So it seems to me that that the the notion you have to be that there is not baked into this bylaw the notion that you have to be using a pre-existing building. You can build a new one. You could uh, demolish and and uh, and do another one. The only thing that was left over was what happens when you get close to a lot line. And there it seems to me that the language I read earlier is fully consistent with the notion that it doesn't have to be a primary garage. And that for that matter, the rules that do apply to garages don't apply to the accessory but uh, buildings that are envisioned by the bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, that, uh, that enlightenment because that's, I, I understand what you're saying. I just, uh, my memory of the conversations revolved a little differently than that during the creation of the bylaw. But as you say, the words are what the words are in the bylaw. And where it is silent, I guess you can do that. Even though my, my memory of the discussions were different than that. All right. Well, well thank you. Uh, one additional question. Um, was the plan for the uh, the Arlington Housing Corporation and the applicant, and I'm not sure who the applicant is there for, <laughs> I guess it's the corporation, I'm not sure, uh, was, is the plan to make this, uh, uh, when you set an affordable rental unit, would the plan be for that to uh, transfer with the property uh, or uh, is it just an aspiration? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by transfer for with the property, but it will be a rental unit. So it will basically, as if 40 to 42 Dorothy Road was a, you know, a triple decker or a three family, it will. I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question. So, so but would, at this point, the, the Housing Corporation of Arlington does own the building at 4042. It would be operating it as, you know, we'll, we'll continue operating it as an accessible mm -hmm. property. Um, and thus, the ADU will add a third affordable right. unit on the property. Okay. All right. I didn't know uh, with the whole discussion we've had about affordability lately, if it was going to be something which uh, would follow with the property uh, in terms of defining what affordable is, market mm -hmm. rate or less than that. Yeah. In but, fact, yeah. we plan to set the same affordability restriction that we have on the other house, mm -hmm. uh, on the existing house, um, just to make things a little easier to manage. And so it'll, it'll align with our, the rest of our portfolio as far as level of affordability. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so it does sound like we have a couple of questions for inspectional services. Um, and we would love to give the, the develop, the, the, uh, uh, the building designer an opportunity to see if there's a way to come closer to being within the requirements of the zoning bylaw. Um, so actually, for, well, first we have no other people in the speaking queue, so I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment. Um, so with that done, then um, we have, as I said, we have questions for special services. There are some uh, questions for the uh, for the designer about what they may be able to accomplish. Um, so my recommendation, if if uh, if the applicant is amenable, would be to uh, seek to continue this hearing um, to give us an opportunity to for both sides to to do a little bit of research. So we can come back together with a little more a little better information in front of us. Um, so we do have. We did just continue something to November 28th. Um, we do have a hearing on November 14th. If um, there's a sense that we can that we could get information together by that date, um, and there's also December 12th. Uh, so I would just ask the applicant if any of those three dates, being November 14, November 28, or December 12, would work for them. Erica, November 14 works for us. If that works for you. Yeah, we could we could make that work. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. So with that, then. Um, Mr. Chair. Ms. Blank. I just have one more quick thing. Yes, um, please. I just was noticing with the elevations, with it being on the helical piles, there's a there's a gap between the bottom of the the building and and the ground. And I was just 
curious if there's been any thought about um, how that may get infilled to prevent, um, you know, debris or, you know, wildlife living in there. And I think maybe if that's something that can come back either uh, when, you know, when we do continue it to the next one, it's, um, just come back with a thought on that. Thank you for raising that. This is still an early schematic design. The plan is to have skirting around it so it doesn't, uh, none of the stuff is exposed, but we'll make sure to update our, our drawings for the, the hearing on the 14th. That'd be much appreciated. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Before making a motion on this, I just wanted to say again what I think has already been clear, but just just to make it very clear, given the state statute, if we have to grant a variance, we'll have a hard time doing it. So the task that's before us is to figure out some combination of of figuring out what what the real of dealing with the rules and dealing with the building that it get the variances out of the picture. If this is a special permit only, then it will not be a particularly hard problem for us, I think. But if it's a variance, it's an extremely difficult problem. So that's kind of what the task, the mission is uh, uh, for the next couple of weeks. And and I wish the applicant a great success in being able to do that. Absolutely. So with that, then the chair would entertain a motion to continue the hearing for 4042 Dorothy Road to a date certain of November 14th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Second. Second, second Mr. DuPont. So this is a motion to continue <clears throat> uh, to the date certain of November 14th. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. <clears throat> Chair votes aye. We are continued on 4042 Dorothy Road. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> Look. Um, so with that, then we would move on to docket 377-128 Buena Vista Road. Um, would first like to express our gratitude for their patience uh, this evening. It's been a lot longer getting to you than we had anticipated. Um, but with that, I would ask the applicants if they could introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Yes, thank you for um, for having us. Um, I'm Valerie Bruno Stone. My husband, Matthew Stone, is sitting next to me. Hello. And we're also joined by our architect, Leslie Mahoney. Um, Hello. Hello. We are uh, excited to, to bring this plan forward. We purchased our home at 28 Buena Vista Road uh, with plans to stay long-term and invest in Arlington. Um, our oldest child began kindergarten this fall um, and our youngest will be in school in another three years. Um, so we have many more years to reside and invest in our neighborhood and in our community. Um, our home truly has not been updated since it was built in the 1940s. Um, we've lived without a dishwasher with two young children uh, for several years, which is no small feat. Um, all the work that we have done to improve our home so far, uh, for example, the windows and the roof, we've done in keeping with the original character of the house, and we have uh, every intention of, of doing the same with this proposed addition. Um, we uh, believe that there's actually very little impact on the view from the street, um, and uh, that that's a, a plus in our design. We've lived here you know, now for almost eight years. We have a good sense of how our family lives in the space and our needs for the space. And we've designed the space with that in mind um, and tried to be very efficient and mindful of, of how to make efficient use of the space to preserve as much um, open area as possible. Um, so we'd like to request your support in expanding our home to meet our family's needs um, and continuing to, to grow and invest um, in our neighborhood and in our community. Um, and so with that, we'll, we'll turn it over to our architect, Leslie. Leslie, would you like permission to share your screen? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Colleen, if you could take care of that. Perfect. Thank you so much. You should be all set. Okay. That's the one. Okay. Um, 
So I'll explain to you how um, we have a pre-existing non-conforming house on a non-conforming lot. Um, these are just existing elevations. And, it, and I will I'll point out right here on the right side elevation, there is a small screen porch that is currently uh, has no foundation. It's just on piers. And I'll be talking about that. Um, all the addition is going primarily on that right side and on the rear. These are the existing plans. And this is looking from the front. That is the screen porch. It's more of a sunroom, really. Um, the foundation plan, you'll see where we are adding. We're adding foundation where that sunroom was. And um, it is a similar um, footprint, but it is pulled a back toward the house by six inches. We are currently non-conforming um, on this side. Um, the right side has um, 8.6 feet to the property line, and um, we are planning to make it nine. And then on this side over here, we are currently, where do I have that information? We're currently sitting at nine feet and we're extending that line straight out of the house. The other non-conformity at the property is just the property itself, um, which only has a 50 foot front um, only has a 50 foot front um, street and we're required to have 60. So here you can see what we're adding. We're just adding some living space, a family room, an expand in a kitchen, and then a deck in the rear. The second floor, that space has a new primary bedroom over it. So it now becomes a fourth bedroom. And then in terms of the site plan itself, this is, I'm sorry about this, but it's looked at from the opposite side from the rear of the house. So this is the existing property and this is the new property. So in terms of gross square footage, um, we are adding more than 750 square feet we are adding um, 1,272 square feet. And um, this is a sloped piece of the property here. And so, but our usable space still fits on the more or less flattish area in the rear of the property. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So those are the large issues with this, this is two story and this new piece on the side is one story. Right. Here are the new elevations. So this is the new elevation to the rear. This is the elevation from the front and you can see the rebuild of the sunroom in a smaller configuration and part of the primary bedroom that pops up behind, which is here. Um, just a quick question. So in the the upper right corner, um, the, unfortunately, the, just they both say left side on the right side there. Um, yes, for one, you you would see. So you're on the you're adding a a sort of a new shed essentially off the the, the main ridge going towards the rear. Um, so that would pop up on the you just see a, an, a little sliver of it um, in that upper plan. I'm a little, I'm just not quite sure what I would be looking at from that side. And I, I, it's partially because I'm a little confused by the the gable on the, the, the new gable on the rear where the peak of it is just slightly offset from the main building. I'm just not quite mm -hmm. sure how all those facets come together. Right, I have a roof plan here. Let me show that to you. Maybe that will help. 
So this is the new rear piece that's being added and mm -hmm. it's a shed roof that's being overlaid on the main house itself. Okay. Um, the existing ridge is parallel to the street and then the new gabled roof is tying into that shed roof. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I've attempted to line these up and due to just dimensional yeah. reasons, it hasn't happened. Um, is partly that, because we're trying to keep this line exactly where it is. Right. <laughs> um, is the, the dashed line, is that an inflection in the roof or is that just the line of the existing house? That's the line of the existing house. Okay. Yep. This is overlaying all the way up as shown here. This yep. this is the new kitchen and primary bathroom addition here. And there's a roof line that's going all the way up there. Okay. Um so as you had said that there's nonconformities in the side existing nonconformities in the side yards. Um, right. On the one side, the nonconformity is being reduced from uh, 8.6 feet to 9.1 feet. So it, it's moving farther away. On the other side, even though it's in line with the side of the building, because it's at an angle to the side lot line, that one is slightly increasing from 9.1 to 8.9. That's um, right. As it goes and back. even less with the deck, but we can certainly hold the deck back. Yeah, it increases by about two inches because the side line is at an angle. Okay. Um, and then, as you said, the frontage is not existing, not conforming. The lot area is existing, not conforming. Neither of those are right. touched. Um, and then the other question I had was in regards to the usable open space. Um, so you had indicated um, that you were that the proposed usable open space is 930 square feet. Mm -hmm. And the proposed gross floor area is 3,264. And that comes up to a usable open space percentage of 28%, which is less than 30. Oh. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a couple more inches in that flat-ish space in the back that there is a yeah. usable open space back there that would keep you under uh, over 30 percent um because you can actually go so the usable open space can extend over the deck okay so you can bring it up to the back of the house and i think that will get you where you need to be yeah that would be fine yeah absolutely okay yeah inspectional services considers going on to decks as as an acceptable practice for usable open space okay Yeah, we can show a new calculation for that. And then um, this, and as you have said, this is a request, this is a large addition. Um, right. And so the board would, in addition to the regular findings, the board would need to find that the alteration or addition is in harmony with the structures and other uses in the vicinity that consider the dimensions and setbacks in relation to the abutting structures and uses and consider conformity with purposes of bylaw. So with that, I would ask members of the board if they have questions and comments in regards to this application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I have a question. The, because this is a uh, large addition, it's especially important, the relationship between the addition and the surrounding properties. And I wondered if you could, or the, if the owner could provide some description of how the, of what's on the other properties that are around here, that uh, I hate to put it in terms of what would the neighbors think, but that's kind of <laughs> where where you are, and and it makes a difference how crowded it is and so forth, as you no doubt have noticed in in some of our earlier cases. So, if somebody could just describe what's what's around this and how the, this addition is going to relate to uh, the uh, dimensions and and where the other properties are, uh, the other buildings are in the in the immediate vicinity. So our 
neighbor to the um, been looking at the house to the left um, has a very similar. Sorry, I can't. Uh, could could you try to get a little closer to the microphone? Is your hard hard to to hear? Sorry, uh, our neighbor to the left of our property has a very similar addition. It's a slightly larger house than ours. Um, they did their addition just this uh, uh, this year. Um, the neighbor to the right of ours has a very similar footprint and their deck uh, extends out to about where the end of our uh, addition would be. Um, so I would say, um, I, I wouldn't describe it as a crowded um, situation. Right, here we go. Yeah, you can see the addition that the neighbor put on here. It's very similar. It's a two-story addition. And then this is the neighbor over here who has the deck that extends out similar to where we're going to come out to. And then to the rear of us, the house is uh, is quite a ways away, and it's sort of a lower elevation as well. So it doesn't. Uh, there's a fair amount of space between there. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Zip around. Very helpful. Thank you, Google. <laughs> um, other questions and comments from the board? Seeing none, um, I will go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. Just reminded the public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand, um, should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public who wish to speak can use the digitally raise their hand using the raise hand button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Or if you're calling in by phone, you can dial star nine. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the board? Mr. Moore, did you want to raise your hand? Nope. Okay. And with that, I see no members of the public who wish to address the meeting. So I will go ahead and close public comment um, as it relates to this uh, hearing. Um, so just uh, so for the board, uh, what we have before us, um, this is an application uh, which comes to us for a special permit for the large addition. Uh, but additionally, there is an existing nonconformity. So there would be a very slight increase in the nonconforming nature of the structure. And we just need to find that it would not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, so are there other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. Rick Fidelli. Um, I sort of hate to ask this question since we've uh, I talked about this a lot this evening, but uh, I, I remember reviewing a similar case um, with a, a two-story addition on the back. And I'm, I'm just looking at the pictures of this house and there's a significant grade change. I, I, I'm just wondering if that average grade calculation has, has been done for this, just to make sure that um, that lowest level is, is not counted as a level. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Mahoney, if, if that's something you've already looked at. Yes, I did look at it and I am, um, it's not an official level. I'm just counting it in the gross square footage. Right. Um, I have the information here. The, um, shoot. <laughs> Is the question asked on the um, application? The application would ask for the existing height and proposed height. Um, right. I know I show on the rear elevation drawing the um, average height of the structure. And I do have basement story if ceiling is 4.6 above grade. It's not. 
The uh, um, elevation show the average grade. Yeah, I would have to find those calculations and get them to you. I did calculate it and it does not count as a story. Okay. Because I had the same, I was curious as well. Great, yeah, we uh, we had a, a recent case where uh, it, it looked just like this house, uh, and uh, we, it was just it just tipped over that um, took that border into being a story, and it got much more complicated from there. So, uh, thank you. Sure, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Um, one thing I just point out is in, in the memorandum we got from Inspectional Services today, there was no indication that there was a potential violation of the yeah, rule of heightened stories. So, I at least take comfort in the fact that ISD has not signaled that as an issue. Good point, thank you. Okay, so with that, are there anything further from the- Mr. Board? Chair? Did, did, just to, to have it clear on the record, I think that when we look at the three particular criteria, the compliance with the purpose of the zoning bylaw, uh, the dimensions with respect to other uh, uh, uses and, and buildings in the vicinity, that the answer that we were provided uh, when I asked that question was uh, was appropriate. It seemed to me that that it did allay the notion that there was somehow an unusual crowding here or something that that would make this un unreasonably uh, <clears throat> impinge upon uh, buildings or uses in in the immediate vicinity. Uh, so that the I think that the board can find that each of the three requirements of the uh, of this particular of the special regulation are are met. On the uh, without going through all of the other seven, it seems to me that this is consistent with the with the neighborhood. It, it's clearly allowed by a special permit, and that the board can find that each of the uh, requirements of uh, section three point three point three uh, are are fairly clearly met in this case. Great, right, thank you. And to that, I would just add the in regards to the the increase in the nonconforming nature of the structure that it is. In, incredibly minor going from 9.1 to 8.9 feet on the one side and is uh, more than well offset by the in by the reduction in the non-conforming nature on the opposite side of the house so mr chairman here when when the motion is ev is is eventually made as as it i assume there'll be a motion to approve this uh, we ought to be clear that we're talking <clears throat> just in an abundance of caution is that we would not only be addressing the grant of a large addition, but also uh, any possible question about the extension of an existing nonconformity. Absolutely. So should the board uh, vote to approve, uh, there are three standard conditions that the board would impose um, on a grant such as this. The uh, first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with the application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two is the building inspector is hereby notified that he's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time, he determines that violations are present, Building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And then standard number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, with those, are there any additional uh, conditions that the board would want to uh, impose upon this grant. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, er earlier, there was a question about uh, adjusting, uh, about usable open space. And I think that uh, Ms. Mahoney undertook to um, update the plans to show more cl clearly where the usable open space would would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I think a condition that uh, that the applicant um, 
update its plans in order to uh, correct the, the calculation of usable open space would be a useful additional criteria. So we have, uh, so the applicant is to provide a revised site plan indicating and dimensioning the areas of the existing and proposed site that comply with the requirements for usable open space is indicated in section two of the zoning bylaw town of Arlington to the inspection services department for review and approval. That was terrific, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> it's not like I had that pre-written or anything. <laughs> um, is there anything, any other conditions that uh, members of the board would want to consider? Seeing none, with no further questions, uh, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the board approve this application subject to the three standard conditions plus the additional con condition uh, updating usable open space that the chair just read into the record. Uh, can... Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to approve a special permit for 28 Buena Vista Road with the four conditions as previously read into the record. Um, the vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The special permit for 20th one of its road is approved. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And again, thank you for your patience this evening. <laughs> thank you. Indeed. <laughs> Good night. Night. And we'll say the success rate of people uh, in cases that start after 10 o'clock is really very high at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Glad let that get around. Uh, <laughs> we almost finished earlier than town meeting would, but just over. <laughs> it, it feels good to be non-controversial. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. It will be, I hope you are happy ending on a high note. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Thanks, again. good night. Um, so just for the board, so we did continue two hearings. We have one that's continued to the 14th, one that's continued to the 28th. Uh, according to Colleen, we don't have any other items on the agendas for those two nights. Um, but I had asked her for the 14th um, to put some time in for the board. So we've been kind of going at a breakneck pace on a lot of stuff uh, for a while. And I think it would be a good time for us to, to just sort of uh, take a breather and review uh, some of our procedures, some of our documentation. Um, I think a lot of you noticed that this was the first time we got the, the applications were electronically submitted for the zoning board. Um, so I think we want to take a look at that at that procedure, make sure that it's we're getting you know, the documentation that we're able to get works well for us, that the procedure works well for the applicants. I think we're going to have to make some adjustments to our rules and regulations in order to better uh, coincide with that. Um, there's definitely a couple of things that I, I know I need to adjust, um, as well. And, the uh, the other thing I'd like to try to do on the 14th is talk a little bit if there are any zoning, um, amendments that we would like to propose. Um, I know we've talked several times about the gap between an attached and a detached dwelling. Um, there's a couple others that I sort of picked up along the way, and today we were sort of that question about accessory dwelling units uh, being within six feet of the thing would be good to sort of clarify. So if there are any sort of things like that that have sort of come up, that you've come upon, um, it'd be great to discuss them on the 14th. And then I will schedule time with the ARB in December uh, to discuss those with them um, as they put together their docket going into the spring. They have notified me that they are planning to put forward a major zoning package for the Arlington Heights Overlay District. Um, so they they do have some other big things they're trying to do in the spring. Um, but I have been nagging them about these ones. So hopefully we'll be able to get this included in the spring as well. Um, so that's what we'll do on the 14th, um, as well as uh, that other case that we just put onto the 14th. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I'd especially like to thank Colleen Ralston and Mike Cunningham for their assistance in preparing for and hosting and participating in this online meeting. 
Please note the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to dba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thanks, Mr. Second. And thank you, Mr. DuPont. The vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. Hoffman. Aye. And Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much. Sorry it was a late night, and uh, we'll see you all on the 14th. Have a good one. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.